give them a revolution. Left reckoning, left is best. Extravaganza, thank you all so much for being here tonight. My name is Conan Neutron. So lovely to see you. Give yourself a big round of applause. Let's see you. We got an incredible show for you. We got some Ben Burgess. We got some Jason Miles. We got David Grissom. And that look. No, no, no. Get this guy, Sam Cedar. Of the deep state. <laughs> we got Jake, we got J. Andrew World, we have an amazing show for you, and kicking us off, Naomi, your buddy. Please give her a huge round of applause. Keep it going for your host for this evening. Make some noise for Coleman. Good to see you guys out here. Are you pumped for this live podcast? Oh yeah, hell yeah. Look how many chairs are up here. They're going to be watching you. You're going to be entertaining them. Oh my god. Right. Do you guys live in New York City? Make some noise if you live in New York City. Hell yeah. Nice. Yeah, I just moved back to New York a couple months ago. It was amazing looking for an apartment during the worst housing crisis of all time. Anybody else? It's like almost impossible to get an apartment in New York right now, right? Like, what do you need to do? You need to spend every day on Zillow looking at the listings, right? Then you learn Yiddish. <laughs> and then you wire money to somebody who might not have an apartment, right? <laughs> he definitely didn't look like he had an apartment. The same in Boston. Oh, that's really good for the momentum of the joke. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't they give you a place to submit questions ahead of time? Where was I? Oh yeah, you've seen apartment brokers, right? They look like the least employed people in the city. I'm like, dude, I am about to give you more money than I've ever handed anybody in my life. Why are you wearing a hoodie? This is too casual for a robbery, what's happening here. Like, my apartment broker, he was like the laziest Hasidic Jew I've ever seen in my life. And I'm Jewish. Like, this guy didn't even have curls. He had a beach wave. Like, he wasn't even trying with God, you know? But I finally found an apartment that I liked, and I was like, all right, I'll take this. And he was like, okay, you could just Venmo me $500. I'm like, what? Okay, uh, do you want more? And I Venmoed him $500, and then he went missing. He didn't respond to my texts. I'm like, holy shit, did I just get scammed for only $500? Like, I was planning on giving you everything, Craig. I was like, what am I, a senior citizen? How did I fall for that? That guy just had a door code. Why did I give him hundreds of dollars? But uh, actually got back to me the next day. It turns out he was just observing the Sabbath. He was just observing the Sabbath, so that wasn't a scam. But you know what was? Hebrew school. That, I want my money back. I didn't learn any Hebrew, and I didn't get any connections to the New York City real estate market. So I want my money back. Um, I, I used to live in D.C. Anybody from D.C. in the house? Okay, that's an unusual response for D.C. <laughs> I mean, DC's. I mean, DC's a cool place. It gets a bad rap, but like, um, more drugs are legal in DC than here. <laughs> Even though nobody can do them because they work government jobs. It's like just a cruel, practical joke played on the city. And I'm like, is the government really worried that people are gonna smoke weed and spill government secrets? <laughs> like, you know, that side effect of weed. <laughs> talking like that's not one of them like i had a friend who took a strong edible she went mute for three weeks like maybe you should put it in the water i don't know maybe they're worried like somebody in the military will smoke weed you know you can't have that they gotta look tough you can't have a four-star general smoke a fatty and then he starts to worry about things he said decades ago like oh man i gotta 
apologize to Stacy. And Afghanistan, Jesus Christ. He just calls up the Taliban to say he's sorry. He's like, Supreme Leader, got a question. Uh, these past 20 years, was I being weird? Was I? Um, but yeah, are you guys excited that drugs are legal in New York now? Yeah, it smells like it. Um, so people in the front are excited about that. The people in the back are parents. What's going on here? Yeah, to me, honestly, it's like a little bittersweet that all these drugs are becoming legal now. Because how do we know who's cool? <laughs> you know, I was cool because I drove a car fully tripping on acid on the highway. Yeah. Now that's everybody's Sunday afternoon. Like, I don't have other stories. Like, what am I going to tell my grandchildren? They're going to be like, Grandma, you did medicine for fun? <laughs> There's psychedelics in our Flintstones vitamins. Because I don't think in the future we're going to be able to tell children not to do drugs since we're discovering new medical benefits every day. So what's the D.A.R.E. program going to become, huh? You're just going to have a police officer walk into the classroom and he's going to be like, All right, kids, uh, just talk to your doctor and find out if ketamine is right for you. <laughs> That's basically what it'll be, thinking of things we learned in school. Remember when we thought recycling was going to save the planet? <laughs> yeah, and then scientists were like, oh no, it's too late. But still, separate it, separate it. I'm glad we got rid of the straws, because that was the problem, clearly. I just think we should get rid of straws altogether. You know, the substitutions, they're no good. The paper straws, they go limp. I'm like, am I doing this right? <laughs> what is going on? How long have I been drinking this iced coffee? What is going on with this geriatric tube? Like, what is happening here? And then we have stainless steel metal straws. I think that's really sending a message to these turtles. Like, we're going to finish the job next time. <laughs> you better watch out. <laughs> um, but I was, a, I was a teacher here in Brooklyn for a couple of years. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for those who are clapping. Fuck you to the rest of you who are not. Um, yeah, sometimes I miss teaching because now I heard you get a free gun. And I remember having to buy staplers. That seems a little bit unfair to me. And my students actually found out that I was doing stand-up comedy when I was teaching. And uh, boy, oh boy, did they immediately lose respect for me and ask me for drugs. But the hardest part of it was it just became impossible to just tell a joke in class. You know, the bar got way too high. All of a sudden, I was just telling like a normal run-of-the-mill, you know, Abraham Lincoln didn't like the play, he preferred the book, one of those, you know, regular crowd pleaser. Works every year, I turn around, there's no laughs, none. And one kid's like, how do you expect to make it in this business with those kind of jokes? I'm like, David, you're a 19-year-old freshman. We're both not going to make it, okay? But I did really care about the kids. I mean, one of the best things about teaching is going on field trips. There is nothing like walking into a movie theater with 150 teenagers and seeing the faces of other people there. <laughs> I'm like, enjoy your matinee, motherfuckers. <laughs> but I brought my students to see 12 Years a Slave back in the day, and uh, I have a special, special thing to read you. What I didn't know was that my students were seated with a New York Times writer. <laughs> and he wrote my principal a three-page letter about his experience, which I wanted to share with you here tonight. And I just performed this for Jeremy Corbyn the other night, and he liked it, so if you guys don't, fuck you. All right? Um, so here it goes. Dear Principal Weinberg, by way of introduction, I'm a columnist for The Times. <laughs> and a resident of Brooklyn. And it pains me to write to you today, but it pains me more not to do so. This is definitely the final draft, right? I have lived in many countries. 
I have been your student's age. I watch movies almost every week in different cinemas across New York. Okay, he starts to brag that he's well-traveled. He's been my student's age, which I would have assumed at some point, but now I think he's lying about that. He goes on, and never in my life have I been so ashamed and embarrassed by behavior in a movie theater as I was today. I'm like, oh my God, what did my students say in this movie about slavery? Oh my God, are we gonna have to do the whole curriculum over again? Like, what did they say to make this man so angry? Well, apparently one of the kids said that the actress had extremely small titties. <laughs> he goes on, they complained and requested something more copious as we watched one of the greatest degradations of American history take place. Now, he goes on and on. We really ruined that guy's movie, and I'm really proud of my kids for that. But we weren't worried as teachers, you know, is he gonna write something in the New York Times about our school? Like, we were highly rated, were we gonna go down? But I wrote him a reply. Would you like to hear it? Okay, dear redacted name, because I don't want to hear from him. Uh, it, and I'm Jerry Dargas. Uh, what was that? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so, dear Anon, thank you for. T this is a mistake. I know it. This is gonna come back to haunt me. But thank you for taking the time out of your busy day of matinee watching. <laughs> writing, and general fury at the world to notify my principal of my students' behavior. It is true that they besmirched all of American history that afternoon at the Regal Union Square 14 Cinema <laughs> and brought shame upon Bay Ridge High School. There has been a long, unfortunate, and shameful history in the United States of favoring big titties <laughs> over small titties. In fact, I fear that I may be part of the oppressor class. Whenever I have a drink brought for me, I believe I have taken that rum and coke directly out of the hands of a woman with small titties. I agree that this is a serious issue, and perhaps Steve McQueen will one day address the tragic fate of small-breasted women in 12 years of concave chest. Thank you. Until then, I will be sure to address this issue in my curriculum directly after I cover the difference between fine art and penis graffiti. I so appreciate that you're getting involved in the community and that you're not a cunty, out of touch, intellectual. Yours sincerely, Miss Carabani, PhD cup, and instructor of American history. Guys, thank you so much. Enjoy the show, it's gonna be so fun, thank you. Please give it up for Conan. Give up one more time for Naomi Caravani. Redacted tonight. Redacted tonight. Uh, check her out on all the social medias. We need to uh, support our funny people. We need to support them being funny. You guys having a good time? Yeah! All right. How great is this? This is fantastic. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get right down to it, people. They talk about the home court advantage. Right? The home court advantage, you heard about this? It's big sports crowd, I guess. Okay. Uh, we're in New York. Everybody, New York, right? Okay, the natural thing we want to do when we start bringing these folks out, right? These amazing folks. They're going to entertain you, they're going to enlighten you. We're going to start the home court advantage. And we're going to bring in Mr. Matt Leck. Matt Leck, everybody. Left Reckoning, majority of the the Matt Leck, media empire. Just go call the cinematic universe, am I right? <laughs> and of course, who can forget? His partner in love right my, my man, my main man with the classic country sounds. <laughs> Give it up, please. All the way, Dave Briscoe. 
I'm gonna call you poet, Rick. Look at all those things you got. This is free, right? Yeah. This is the top of the tree? Yeah. All right. Now, we are also going to give you an argument. Woo. Right? So for that, we need we need a superhero. We need a superhero of the philosophical kind. We need the best possible superhero. Please, 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 dig deep. Give it up for Mr. Ben Burgess. There he is. There he is. And of course, we really, really need you to dig as deep as you can now. Just find it within your soul. For my main man, this is revolution. Mr. Jason Miles! Let's rock the clock. Give it up for Conan Neutron. Woo! We're not even from out here. We're from hella far away. And Conan goes, dude, you're going to be in New York. And I was like, yeah, I'm telling him to be in New York. He's like, I think people are going to show up to this show. I was like, I know, right? <laughs> I've been coming to New York forever, man. Playing to nobody, so this is really cool. So thank you all so much for showing up. And I know it's because of Sam Cedar, so... <laughs> You, sir. Free shirt. <laughs> ben Burgess, my new neighbor. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. They say Mexico is sending their best, but can I check it out? Right? <laughs> we are sending our best to Mexico. <laughs> are those Mexicans? <laughs> so, when we flew here, uh, we flew... Well, these aren't really jokes like Naomi has. This is just us talking shit before the show. Yeah. It was like a cold open. But this is a true story. True story. There's a little Jewish woman that'll be in my ear. She pointed this out to me because I didn't even pay attention to it. We flew into... Two minutes in, we've got the casual anti-Semitism going. <laughs> That's what you're here for, Ben. Just to keep us honest. It's our beard. Ben knows I love Kanye. <laughs> But enough with the true jokes. But seriously, so I never, I'd never seen this before, and I don't even know if you noticed it because we're all stressed out. It's kind of chilly on the plane. But uh, a little bit. But uh, see, and so <laughs> I never saw this before, and it was a memorial to 9/11. Maybe you guys have flown out of the Palm Springs Airport. I didn't know. I've never seen a memorial like this. Usually, when you see memorials. It's like a dirty faced fireman with like dirt on his face and like it's flag. But this memorial was literally the planes exploding into the car. <laughs> oh, and don't forget George W. Bush, like reading my paper. <laughs> yeah, George W. Bush. They put that at the memorial. That's amazing. What, reading to the kids? Yeah. yeah. Yes! It's because he's such a sweet fella. You know? I think we all felt like we. Just wish we could have been read to by George W. Bush. I was saying, as, as somebody, as somebody, as somebody um, who you know went to public high school in Austin, Texas, when George W. was our governor, he does do the voices very nice. <laughs> Dude, what? Okay, I hate flying. I hate flying. I, I love horror movies. Hate flying. Like love Final Destination. Well, watch part one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> hate flying. I hate, Jordan, do I hate flying? She's saying I hate flying, just trust me. <laughs> and uh, to see the planes crash as you're taking yeah, off your shoes and the terrorist jet. <laughs> what the shit, Palm Springs? <laughs> Takes your mind off the ticket price, though. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you land, yeah. Oh yeah, and then, uh, like in my mind, so so if you've ever, you, people have flown, <laughs> watch these shows, you guys got a couple bucks. Uh, if you fly in, in like mountainous regions, it's rough. Again, hate flying. But I think that I sound tough. 
I think it sounds tough on a screen. Uh, and and I, in my mind, this is what happened. The plane is taking off, and this big gust of wind hit it. And in my mind, I said this, man. I said, oh! <laughs> Whew, that was hmm. good. According to Jordan, I said, whoo! And then I grabbed the seat in front of me. Mario 64 goes. <laughs> that left wing masculinity, man. They're flaking in their boots. Just to frighten the writers. Right? The planes woke now? I don't know if the planes woke. I did find out on Monday, so anybody who showed, watched my show on Monday, knows that the power was out at Podcast Man on Monday. At Podcast Man. Uh, I had, uh, so, uh, Sam was on with like three times normal viewership. I was doing it for my phone in coffee shop. Uh, but while we were out earlier trying to find a place with Wi-Fi, um, we, I don't even remember what the question was, but there was some kind of question for Siri. Oh, yeah. Uh, I said, so, so me and Ben live in Mexico, not together. <laughs> not that that's weird, close. Fine. But we don't live together, <laughs> no matter what you people think. Yeah, just got a side field that sentence, not that there's anything wrong. But with not that there's anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but, so, but, we're, but we're out like trying to find a place. We're to trying to find a place. And, and we had uh, Jason ask Siri something. And uh, Siri told me the answer. She told me, and I said, gracias. She said, I don't know what that means. You said you're a racist. That's all there is. That's what she said. And her response, I swear to fucking God, Siri is programmed to respond to the accusation of racism. I, I said, <laughs> no, I'm an anti-racist. I'm anti-racist. And then gave us links to kidney books. <laughs> Last one is a trip. I've, I've been very happy to hear Ben. I, I don't mean to embarrass you too much, but this is too funny about the show. Um, because when Ben was first saying he's going out to Mexico, I was stoked for him, beautiful place. You know, it's going to be an interesting experience. Um, but we were in Los Angeles, California, and we we're at this really awesome mole place. And we're sitting down, sorry Ben, but we're sitting down and, uh, you know, they had all these different drinks and Ben's trying to figure out what he wants to order. And he looks at a Oaxaca margarita and he looks at the waiter and he goes, can I have the chocolate cup? <laughs> and I was very nervous about Ben's Mexico experience after that, but it seems like he's got some good tutors since then. <laughs> Sir, sir, I will have you know that I've done 42 days of Duolingo since then. <laughs> so, you know, I'm on top of it. If I am the person translating for you, that's how bad it is for you. It's a lot of nodding and smiles. <laughs> well, should we bring some people on? Yeah. Absolutely. We've got a great on. show coming up tonight, y'all. Really, thank you so much. Um, Please! Yeah. 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 It's so, like, not to be sappy, but it's not. It really is nice to see everyone's faces. Like, there's I, like it's, it's so meaningful for us to be able to do our shows and have this community and stuff. But there's that kind of weird moment where you realize you're just sort of sitting in your room talking into a camera. Yeah. And like you know that some people are watching, but you also just feel like maybe I'm just sitting in my room talking to myself for two hours. So it's wonderful to be able to see all your and, and faces. Oh, yeah, right. Share them with all you. Yeah, yeah. You've never been on Joe Rogan, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's on his Tinder profile. <laughs> you may know me from things such as early Zero Books videos with shit on you. <laughs> the befuddled man on Joe Rogan. I'm just waiting to see how much more he's got in this. Uh, before it's on my time. Tinder profile. Uh, right? yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, should we? Uh, I think so. We bring on uh, the man who, if you ever watched the Michael Brooks show, you probably know him as uh, as Bashkar. Uh, <laughs> consistently said, no matter how many hundreds of times he's corrected. Uh, but, uh, my good friend, my co-author on a book we're working on for Verso, um, uh, my editor Jacobin, friend in real life, uh, very. Uh, very excellent person, even though I will have you know, the first real extended conversation I ever had with him, I told him that I think OJ Simpson probably did do it, and he accused me of being a racist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
I was in the program of Siri, there was a great response to that. But, Bosco, Uh, it was the night uh, that you did, you did like a debate with Kashama Sawant at the uh, Mayday space in Brooklyn. And like we went out for drinks afterwards. Must have been the drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had all sorts of theories going then uh, after, you know, two to three, two to three drinks. Probably, uh, yeah. What is your best OJ theory? Well, I mean, honestly, I, I, I think you Y'all didn't think you were getting OJ jokes. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think he did it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't bring you here to talk about OJ. But the memorabilia thing was totally. <laughs> 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 when he went back in, you know, he, he you have to put that in context. Yeah, right? yeah. You have to put that in context. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go ad hominem. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um. So, so I'm curious, I know that you are working on uh, another book, besides the one we're writing, uh, about uh, Granada, uh, the, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's coming along? So, Grenada, actually, oh, okay, see this told, you. <laughs> told you, told you, Mar Mar Maurice Bishop, uh, the Prime Minister of Grenada uh, during the revolution, uh, actually gave a speech where he said, I have to really thank Ronald Reagan for his speech last time. He's this warmongering speech, like basically threatening invasion. And he said, the rest of the world up to this point thought we were, um, you know, uh, Granada. Now they know we're Grenada. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, the book's going, I'm about 75% finished with the book and 120% finished with my events. Uh, so, <laughs> So yeah, the book's going okay, but you know, it's it's the uh, cold calculus of economic compulsion that I think is going to get it done more than uh, the, the interesting history. Uh, what, what do you mean I can't get another advance about this Grenada book? <laughs> <laughs> the young people want to know about Bishop. <laughs> Everyone's like, who? <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about Maurice Bishop and what happened in Grenada? So, so. so Grenada is interesting because it is the only socialist revolution that happened in a Anglophone country. Um, and, you know, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, that was definitely an applause line, but uh, still earlier than that, we're working our way into it, yeah. But in general, Anglophone Caribbean countries were marked by their um, kind of parliamentary conservatism, even when they did have nominally center-left uh, parties, um, and there were some experiences, like in, in Guyana had a very strong left, and Jamaica had a, had a strong strong left. Um, there was very, very strong limits to what they could do, not only because of the specter of US imperialism or political culture, a host of other factors, uh, and also the fact that you know they, these countries were, at the time, so really deeply wedded to the British um, uh, Commonwealth in a lot of cases. Uh, they, um, Grenada was an example where you had a classic experience of you have an authoritarian government and the only opposition were socialists. Over time, underground, they got more and more radical facing uh, repression, and they were able to take over the government with literally um, an army of uh, a couple thousand people total, uh, which is have a very militarized in, a, in an island of only 80,000 at the time, the Gary regime. They took it over with um, maybe six to eight guns. Uh, wow. they actually, I actually got the story from, from someone who was involved in this raid on a barracks, and he told me, what's the best time to launch an ambush? And I just said, what a strange question to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you say? What, what's the best time to... to, to Why do you look at me? Yeah. Now! Right? That's <laughs> literally <laughs> a hate crime. <laughs> All of you looking at me, and you, Bosco, aren't you supposed to look at me? <laughs> you have the microphone, you ask We all have microphones, Bosco! Jason? <laughs> yeah, Jason, what would you do? I would ambush people when they were asleep. 
for that answer. <laughs> no, but, but you said particularly, uh, you know, you said throughout history, apparently this is common knowledge, I didn't know, uh, 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. is a good time. <laughs> yeah, 4, 4, 4 a.m. is the ideal ambushing time because early risers are not up and, you know, uh, people go to bed late, are sound asleep. So they just rolled in with a couple rifles and a um, and some firecrackers and other stuff, and, <laughs> and, stormed, and stormed an army barracks and armory. Wait, time out, time out. How the fuck does that work with firecrackers? Well, people are. are Someone's like, never had a firecracker. <laughs> That's like badass kids. That's all I did. Burn yourself, Jason. Ah, fuck your fucking knee. <laughs> they made a bunch of noise, they scared people, they had some bolt action rifles, and they uh, took over this armory, and then after that, the reason why I say revolution instead of coup, because a lot of these, you know, uh, left-wing military takeovers in countries, uh, some of them uh, bad, some of them a little bit worse than, than bad in terms of their <laughs> ultimate consequences, like the Sour Revolution in Afghanistan, things like that, are not really revolutions that were more like military coups. Um, you know, the, the Derg in Ethiopia, a lot of, Grenada was a legitimate revolution, because it had a very small band of people, but then you had mass support among Ordinary grenades block, blockading uh, streets, storming um, uh, police stations, arming themselves, and in a bloodless, um, bloodless revolution, I think no one was 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 killed. Uh, they were able to take over the um, a country. And what's interesting for me is that they implemented a very successful economic program, so successful that uh, the IMF and World Bank were eventually by year two of their revolution willing to give them loans, because they're like, oh, the macroeconomics of your um, <laughs> revolution are, 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 are quite good. You know, you're, you're um, using state-owned enterprises in, in intelligent ways. They're basically doing their own version of the new economic uh, program and creating a sort of state-led developmentalism uh, that was wedded to mass uh, programs of literacy and, and, and healthcare and infrastructure building. So it was really quite impressive, especially if you consider the scale of resources that they, they have. Now I have a quick question for you. There were a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot, there was a good amount of leftists, because this is the late 70s, early 80s we're talking about, from where I'm from in the San Francisco Bay Area. I can't believe I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area got more applause than only successful socialist revolution in the whole country. Now from the Bay, we don't know about this shit. Dope's all dead. There was a, a bit of a, a small migration of, of uh, leftists from, from the Bay, kind of leftover holdouts from the Panthers and other you know, organizations that were moving down there as well because they felt that this was going to be a bit of a, a socialist utopia. Uh, in, in Grenada. Yeah, and, and I think for a lot of these people it was a continuation of, of not just um, socialist development but also some of the black nationalism of the, the 60s and 70s. Here was a, a government that was going to add a real economic dimension to, to a struggle that in the U.S. was turning towards just cultural nationalism without the kind of real redistribution of the Black Panther Party days and and uh, and whatever else. Ben. <laughs> so what happened then? <laughs> I mean I, I don't wanna I don't want to be a spoil the ending for everybody. <laughs> yeah, so so ultimately um, it ended in, in fratricide. Um, and it, it it did so I think in a in a interesting way because I think it has concrete lessons because often this ends as a simple parable that people say, which is revolutions that kind of eat their, eat their own. Um, but in the case of Grenada, you had the tension between having, they maintained extreme levels of party democracy until the very end, but they suspended um, a parliament. Their goal was, even though they, they knew they had a mass mandate, they wanted to establish different institutions of participatory democracy from below. They wanted to wait until they had a constitutional referendum, and they said, okay, we'll hold elections in a, in a, a couple years after that. Uh, we basically want a term or two terms based on having the revolution, we're gonna establish certain norms. But what that ended up happening in that case was 
Maurice Bishop, the leader of the revolution, was incredibly charismatic and he had the support of the masses. Um, but within his own party, he, there was tensions and he eventually had his position in certain ways diminished within his own party. Um, there's a lot of confusion about what happened next, but Bishop ultimately wanted to go down the road of the more kind of Fidelista, like Maximo leader. Yeah. Um, and he felt like he had the, the mandate of the masses and that, that things were slow and bureaucratic and he shouldn't have to um, listen to a central committee composed of 20 people from a party of 900 people when he was on an island of 90,000 people and he knew he had this, this, this mass support and the party seemed to be turning against him at the grassroots level. But you're on an island where the only democracy is the party democracy, the left, so they could both claim democratic mandates. And eventually Bishop accused the party of planning a coup and started agitating among some of the masses to basically do a self, a t an attempted self coup, mm -hmm. uh, this way I would describe it. The party then arrested him, put him under house arrest. Um, masses of people went to the house and freed him. The soldiers decided not to fire upon the people. They did the right thing, they let, let them go. But instead of going to the square, like they thought, he went to um, a fort, an armory, and he armed himself and his supporters. And in the end, um, there was an effort to retake the fort. Uh, there was fighting. The soldiers say they were fired upon first. Um, the soldiers also say that like their uh, one among them was kind of beat up and victimized and, 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 and whatever else. And I think in a fit of anger without much coordination, Bishop and the, the Bishop supporters in the Central Committee were, were executed. And I, I think it was done by uh, the, the, the initiation of a soldier whose uh, sister had been was also a soldier and had been uh, beaten up and stripped down her underwear by the mob oh. the bishop led. Um, that's the conclusion of my book. But I mean, that's kind of roughly what you're, I. You're giving it away for free. Yeah. So, so, but a lot of it, I think, the, the takeaway. <laughs> socialists. I think the concrete takeaway, aside from the human drama, and really Bernard Cord, the leader of the the Cord faction. Um, of, of that that many say launched a coup against Bishop and that led to the violence, uh, was friends with Bishop from age nine years old or so. Um, and they were involved in a student-led protest when they were both, when they were 11 and 12 respectively. They're, they were family friends. Or, so it's really a, a tragedy of the, the, you know, it's such a small island, the, the familial roots are so, are so deep. But if you don't believe in any form of parliamentary democracy, or if you don't believe that in any sort of permanence of the state, you end up in a situation where you establish party states. And if you have a party state, you don't really have a democracy. You have the democracy of 900 or 1,000 cadre. No matter how embedded they are among the population, you create situations like this where where there's no way to mediate a dispute, especially in the context of the US threatening invasion, the country being incredibly armed. Um, you know, you have uh, well over a, a couple thousand people in the army or militia, and you have tons of guns floating around because you, you're trying to deter an invasion. And it just ended in uh, horror. And the US took advantage of the situation as soon as there was this internal chaos, and they invaded soon after under false pretenses. Without the support of the UK, the UK was very angry, both the Queen and Mar Margaret Thatcher, because the US basically invaded a country that maintained the Queen as the head of state. And they intentionally did this, because they thought it was going to give them some protection from US invasion. They, they, were, they were wrong. And uh, yeah. Well, we didn't bring you in here just to talk about uh, your book. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I know I think these, these do track, though, because, you know, if, if you're talking about the issues with, like, the party state, um, in the U.S. and in a lot of Europe right now, there's this kind of question of class dilemma, um, where like uh, traditional working class voters um, are one either not voting or even being attracted to like the parties of the right. And like you know, it's it's, it's interesting. Like there was a piece um, in Texas Tribune recently where they went and they interviewed non-voting Texans. Because it's always been the stream in Texas that like Texas is not a red state; it's a non-voter state. Um, they went and they talked to voters, um, working class people who 
don't vote, and they were saying things like, yeah, I voted for Obama in 2008, um, and then I felt that he sort of betrayed the, the promises that he was, he, he was given to us, and I don't think it's worth my time to go out and vote for like a Democratic Party candidate. And like, anyway, so class alignment is like a very broad crisis, um, but if you have this kind of lack of confidence of working people like, in the United States and in Europe, like, what are the kind of things that people on the left, people who think that you know we need to be fighting and winning those kind of voters, instead of like writing them off? Like, I think a lot of like members of the Democratic Party are more interested in sort of winning, you know, suburban voters in a couple of situations. Like, you know, what are the kind of questions that we should be asking ourselves to try to sort of deal with this crisis of like class alignment? I know it's broad, but yeah. that's a big question. I should have read the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so I would say, uh, first of all, um, that we need to tell people that we need the coalition that can bring about, um, to begin with, American social democracy, right? And that coalition is going to be different than necessarily the coalition that could win an election. Because there's many routes to win an election. The Democratic Party route of getting 51, 52% of the vote narrowly through suburbs and winning over more professionals um, off put by the Republican Party, quite obviously works as a route to get Joe Biden elected and win a majority in Congress for a time. And and even with like horrible um, background conditions, like hold up okay in a midterm election. So their strategy obviously works for their terms because this is this is what they want. They want to be able to govern, do a few things on the margins. A half technocratic office, have more respect for the intelligence community, <laughs> you know, like well, whatever the, the, the main like Democratic Party lines of the the Obama knots that kind of stayed in in, in 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 power. You know, this is um this is okay for them. But we really want a different sort of majority. We want to win sixty percent of the American uh, uh, people over to a program that can really fundamentally transform the country, uh, bring about universal health care, uh, a massive expansion in, 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 in unionization, kind of uh, the social base that can really uh, you know, change things for good. Now, there's only one route to make the country more equal, and that has to be a politics framed around taking money and power from the people who have money and power and giving to people who don't have money and power. So I feel like often people say, okay, this is just a simplistic vision of what the working class is. You're not gonna win over every single working class. But of course you're not. People are infinitely complex. The world is infinitely complex. The point of theory and strategy is to reduce something infinitely complex and make it more parsable. So we need the sort of agenda that we're gonna talk about things that are in objective economic interest. We're gonna do so in a plain spoken way. We're gonna tie it to uh, so social forces that actually seem like they're gonna get something done for you. One complaint that people had about Jeremy Corbyn in the, in the UK in his 2019 uh, campaign especially because it seemed too much like a wish list. There was too many things on it. It wasn't focused enough. So I think sure, yeah, keep it simple. Keep it, keep it to the same four or five main agendas. And, and again, you're not going to win over everyone, but you're going to win over enough people that you will actually be able to, if you do win an election, uh, change things and not just squeak by through the through the suburbs. So I, I don't mean to, to pick on you because like I have the same question and like. I don't have an answer. I'm just throwing it to you because you're a smart guy. You were you were a person who's thinking we should draft Bernie, right? You push for a draft Bernie. You know, you saw something. That, I mean, like you know, a lot of people didn't see that that opportunity. Some that really mobilized a lot of people. A lot of people here today, I'm sure, went through their identifying as I think a socialist or Marxist, like through being attracted to that whole the Bernie campaign. I think a lot of people on the left didn't recognize that. So, so I want to ask you this because one of the things that's tough, and it's, it goes with the Jeremy Corbyn thing, but like I talked to some of my union. Um, friends in, in, in Texas, and they say to me, it's like, well, you know, when DSA comes to particularly like working class communities or even just the union folks, and they start promising, like, we're going to have a Green New Deal, um, we're going to have jobs for all, right? All these things I'd like to support, but these people are like, 
Sounds nice, but like I have no confidence that like you can actually produce that. And I, I, I'm just curious if you have any sense of like how do we go from not only having things that we think could be like attractive, which is like we can make a sell on an idea, but also convince people that oh we are the people that you should be talking to to make your life better, right? Like being able to follow through on actions versus just being the guys who have like a really nice picture of the future. <laughs> so, so I think you need both a infrastructure at the local level so people can actually see you involved in local wins and, and can see their their politicians um, are concerned about about their their day-to-day -day needs uh, I think you see that in New York we do have a handful of, of, um, of members of, of, of the state assembly we have a handful of people on the city council and there are people that are tribunes of the needs of their constituents. And sometimes it's very mundane things they're doing, but that adds a level of credibility when they're then uh, supporting a national candidate. And obviously we need to have some sort of win. You know, we can't just promise people the moon and just assume that's gonna, that's gonna work. Is that a chicken or the egg problem? I'm, I'm not sure, I think local wins plus a big soaring national rhetoric, and then also saying, Listen, we tried to get you help here. We tried this way or this way, and, and uh, you know we're not gonna just shrug our shoulders. We're gonna say, here, are, here's the reason why we we failed. Here's the people standing in the way, and they're not all Republicans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right on. Yeah, I think that's right. Thank you. <laughs> do we think we should bring on? Unless anyone else. Well, uh, yeah. yeah so, so we do. Our uh, producer Jordan reminds me. That we do have a very important question for the class that we didn't ask. So uh, this is going to come back up later, but right now, just whatever pops in your head, we're going to do a quick free association game. <laughs> <laughs> Dietary restriction. <laughs> Man, you don't need to like. Uh, <laughs> don't sorry, sorry. Free, free association. Um, vegans. Okay. Country. Cuba. Woo. Nice. Verb. Expropriating. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> Music genre. Um, pop punk. <laughs> cartoon. Um, Dragon Ball Z, is that a cartoon? <laughs> yeah. 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 That is, you successfully did the cartoon, and that is a, a, not a recent one. Place. Havana. <laughs> Food. Um, <laughs> Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, dance move. Uh, electric side. Damn. All right. Well, that is going to come back up later. But uh, meanwhile, Matt, who do we have next? Uh, is it Sam Cedar or is it Emma Vigeland? <laughs> one of them. It's Emma. Emma 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 Oh, Emma. 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 That's about that was too soon. Hey guys. Woo! Emma was living the rock star life in the backstage. <laughs> I may or may not have been about to smoke pot. Uh, <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> I've been Matt Black for a few years, that is 100% not I thought Matt didn't like me for a while. He's had, he's had a different ass face. He's just high. <laughs> Who said go Giants? That better have not been sarcastic. Motherfucker. How are, how are the Cowboys doing right now, y'all? Can somebody give me a score update? Six. 
I'll do it right now. Six, six. All right, let's go, Dad. That's not great news for the over. You're not supposed to have. Huh? Oh, yeah. no, no, no. He's just kidding. I'm so disappointed. Well, um, we have a game to play, don't we? Do we? Oh, are we playing a game? Yeah, are we starting with that? Are we playing Jordan? Are we ready for it, Jordan, or should we start a little bit with something else first? Do we need a second? She says go for the game. All right. So, I'll just ask her guests <laughs> first. We're going to explain the rules really quick, and the audience participation is encouraged. Um, but just, we'll just guess choice here. Um, you pick your top three of left wing, socialist, communist, whatever figures that you would want on either your threes basketball team or quarterback, wide receiver, running back. Gotcha. And you get to pick what sport you want to do. It's just, I feel a little football. I know we were, we were originally going to do basketball, but I'm a little football obsessed right now, so I'm feeling that way. I, I'm feeling that too. You're feeling football? You gotta keep me. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> we need Matt Leck, though, to also. Uh, Matt is getting wait, stoked. Andy. Matt, Matt's getting, Matt, Matt's getting stoked. He'll be back yeah. there. <laughs> but, so. Where's Brad? I don't know where Bradley is. Bradley's staying. Bradley's cheering for the Cowboys at home. I'll let him know that <laughs> you asked for him. Though. He'll be happy about that. Did, right, we wanna, did we want to? Did we want to do a thanks, Matt? Thanks for joining us. Woo! Um, right. <laughs> no marijuana upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> did we want to do this as a panel, or are we doing it just with our guests, just really quick? Yeah, yeah. yeah. do it in a draft yeah. snake, like go around yeah. like that. Yeah, right? a draft snake. Everybody pick one, and we see who wins. All right. right. We should all do our picks at the same time, I think. Because right. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to start. All right. Again. All right. I have my team. Uh, we've already selected. Uh, it's going to be, uh, we're going to take the big three. And look, when you have these conversations, the game changes over decades, right? Like, would, would Larry Bird be as good in today's NBA as, as now? <laughs> and I agree with those folks who say yes, and that's why I'm taking with my first three picks. I'm taking Abraham Lincoln at six four. <laughs> and and you got to like adjust that for current times. So I am six eight. I am taking right? General Sherman and General Grant as the uh, other big three. So we got. Uh, uh, and then for my backcourt, I'm taking. Um, I'm taking. Uh, uh, <laughs> Bill Russell and Kuma Tojibar. This motherfucker got in really early. It was all the good political So Bill Walton, who forced through the NBA Players Association, you can check out our uh, talk with Big Waz on Left Reckoning about that. Yes. And uh, also Kuma Tojibar, who is a uh, published in Jack Magazine. So uh, uh, that was, that's my starting five. Damn good starting five. Okay, um, we're all playing our own game, it seems, but you can't draft anyone else, because I, I have football for mine. Um, with the first pick of the left-wing fantasy football draft, I'm picking none other than probably one of the greatest human beings to ever live, Paul Robeson at running Ooh. back. Ooh. It's tough, um, because... You know, I'm trying to keep it, uh, other than that, I'm trying to keep it like left wing figures rather than. Because the odds on David picking Paul Robeson number one were still 100%. Yeah. <laughs> you, you could have had Paul Robeson for basketball, too. But that, like, that's a, that's an easy game. one if y'all know who Paul Robeson is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If y'all know who he is, you should definitely look him up. Icon. At quarterback, I don't, I've never seen any um, history as to whether or not there's somebody, some folks in the audience might be able to tell me this is true or not, how good he was at the game of football. But at quarterback, I'm drafting none other than the man himself, Eugene Debs. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like that's an all-American boy. He's seen the I like 1875 Debs or, 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 or 1904 <laughs> Debs, which <laughs> Debs you got. Well, you got to go. Like you fresh out the we got to go real. Above, I, want, I, want, I want naive, early career <laughs> Eugene Debs, right? Um, I was ready to the pressure. So do you, do you think Debs came out of jail like... Buff you know? as fuck. <laughs> Buff as fuck. Chewing nails, talking shit. Buff as fuck. Yes. I've yet to meet a motherfucker come out of jail hella, hella just 
calm and skinny. Buff as fuck, organizing like a motherfucker, yes. As opposed to jail devs. And look, at, at this point, again, I don't know what these people's um, stats too well. I'm just going with the big guys. I think that, you know, I thought it was great, for example, um, Fetterman in, in Pennsylvania. I respect, like, big dudes. I think work. that we need to really push this. three picks, then three picks, then three picks. You gotta sneak it around. It will come. You will, you will never guess this, too. Yeah, no. You know me even here knows it. But I'm going back into the socialist tradition, taking the great Texas socialist himself, Big Tom Hickey, and the only thing that matters there is that his name is Big. <laughs> <laughs> a good target uh, for UG devs in the back. <laughs> All right, Emma, who's on your uh, socialist squad? Man, um, I guess there's a lot of great athletes that you can choose from, right? I'm gonna go with Muhammad Ali immediately. <laughs> um, Imagine Muhammad Ali as a running back. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Right, I mean, it would, be like the Bo, it would be like Bo Jackson, but 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 way better. Um, I'm gonna go with that. You already took Abraham Lincoln, right? To send Six four for sneaker. Damn. Um, Tall point guard. You have, you have inspiration you have, you have behind inspiration. you. You got Mal backwards dunking your holes. <laughs> are these AI? You these got are linen. all AI. <laughs> you got linen. You got linen with two basketballs like a goddamn globe trotter. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna take John Brown. Uh, John Brown, the whole shoe is shot. What's going on, baby? He might be like a 40% shooter, but at the same time, you know, when he shoots, he shoots. <laughs> and then, like, fuck it, Bernie Sanders is my. But, but, but again, do you have? Uh, Bernie Sanders running for president 2016 or getting arrested with Dr. K. Yeah, no. Sanders. I, yeah. You, could, you could literally do 2016. I mean, we've all seen him play basketball in 2016. <laughs> hey, if you knew a guy shooting free throws, it's Bernie. Is like, <laughs> foul, foul. I mean, if, I'm, if I'm given the choice between 70 year old Bernie Sanders or 25 year old Bernie Sanders, I'll leave 70 year old Bernie Sanders to Bhaskar. <laughs> Seven-year-old Bernie Sanders got the form down, though. He's just been shooting fruit those for decades. <laughs> no, that's, that's my three. I, I, I just uh, picked five because he's greedy. <laughs> <laughs> and because, yeah, Grant and Sherman come in with Abe Lincoln. That's my big three. It's like Oklahoma City Thunder. <laughs> so, Fidel Castro, there's a bunch of videos of him playing basketball. It's very clear that people are afraid to guard him. <laughs> Assuming that my place in country is where the game was being played, and Fidel for sure. Again. Damn, Fidel was 40 again, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> so what happened to Pepe? <laughs> it's, it's basically the Stonecutters episode of The Simpsons. <laughs> then, I don't know, if Fidel's gonna get all the points, it's really just about chemistry, right? So, <laughs> I, know, I know there are probably like five, five Italian guys, but maybe Sacco and Manzetti? <laughs> I'm surprised no one picked like Che as an enforcer or something like that. I thought he was going to go with the Che. So <laughs> Che's a, like che 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 a poet, it. though. You don't want that on your team. <laughs> but, you know, uh, there's one other person I want to ask what their opinion is. Uh, you, if you guys watch uh, my show, TIR, I uh, have a good friend. <laughs> Uh, Kuba, who would be on your uh, leftist E squad? 
of uh, fantasy players. Wait, are they playing eSports or is it an eSquad of like sports ball for real? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kuba, uh, we'll see you at the next one. <laughs> Kuba, let's say they're playing Rocket League. <laughs> then like, um, Che, because he kind of could be good at anything, and if you lose, like he's the guy you bring out to explain why you lost. <laughs> I am so sorry, but we were thinking about the revolution. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't agree with him. Him, but Kim Il Sung? Is he seems, like, he would win at any cost, right? I mean, he was a badass, like, fighter, right? Badass soldier? I don't know, because he wrote all of the books about that. Right? <laughs> For the Alpha sake of Moon. this exercise, we're taking him at his word, right? He has a plant named after him, and it's like a cool one with a flower and everything. <laughs> So um, that's two, and the third one, um, Enver Hosha from Albania, because Woo! you will have no follow-up questions. <laughs> that's a that's a solid score. That's a solid score. Well, is there anything else we have for Bashkar? Wait, 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 wait! Before we go, I mean. Quick, real quick, audience. I mean, who's winning? I mean, everyone just bullshitted a, a team here. I mean, Matt's winning because he cheated. <laughs> <laughs> it's Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Emma. Yeah. Deep State Cuba. <laughs> Baskar. No Kimo Sugas in this house, Juche. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> uh, I guess we're giving it to Matt. So. Yeah. Vaskar, <laughs> oh. thank you so much uh, for chilling with us. Uh, we'll be back up a little bit later. Everyone give it up for Vaskar Shim. Oh. I am I am so proud, you know, that like my my good <laughs> friends cheated, what the fuck? <laughs> my good my good my good friends, you know, my uh, my collaborators that over the course of like twenty production meetings leading up to tonight. I taught them all how to say the man's name correctly. I was a little nervous when I saw it. I was like, wow, I don't fucking just do the main stare right at me. I should have been too, but. I think there's just one person who has an issue with it, and he's yet to be on stage. Ooh, I'm looking at him right here. There he is. In the green room, the real life green room. So, should we um, start talking a little sports here? Sure. So, there's been a lot going on um, in both the NFL and the NBA, and I'm just curious, like, um, in particular, starting with like football, which is the only thing I care about. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think Amber really cares about either, so Honestly, he cares about like, basketball. Honestly, I'm being honest about it, yes. <laughs> you know, a lot of times people have been using this term for like the NBA, like it's like the players do. The players wield tremendous amounts of power. The NFL doesn't seem as strong, but you did see at the Bills Bengals game a pretty incredible showing of player solidarity. People aren't familiar with that. Um, Joe Burrow and uh, you're the expert. Josh so. Allen. Yeah. yeah, Josh Allen basically said, "We're not going to play this game, on, you know, because somebody got it, like critically okay. injured, almost killed, almost killed." It was one of those devastating things I've ever seen um, in an NFL game. And I'm just curious, like your sense of somebody who follows the NFL, somebody who has sympathies with, like, you know, working people of all different stripes. You know, do you think we're entering into a period where maybe NFL players are going to have a little bit more ability to dictate terms and to fight for themselves? I hope so, and I think so. I mean, I, I think that there's a, a lot of misconceptions about what, like, actual labor action means in professional sports, because a, the layman, sorry, will say, oh, you know, you're making a million dollars a year, why do you have... Uh, kind of the sympathy of labor, or why are you a labor organizer? But the reality of the situation is, is in, in terms of the NFL, these guys come largely from nothing, and their careers are three to four years, where they have an opportunity to make 
two million dollars a year for the rest of their lives and then what does the rest of their life mean and so I, it's incumbent upon the left to actually support those people and not write them off as <laughs> millionaires other people that are trying to seek glory um, especially because as opposed to the NBA there is a vacuum of support for uh, professional football players, largely, I think, because a lot of them come from the South. It's a more conservative sport in general. But the way that labor organizing is tilted, it, it, it totally fucks over NFL players. Their contracts are not guaranteed. They'll, it'll say you're making $2 million a year, but in the end you make $100,000 a year, and that's the, the entirety of your contract because it's not injury guaranteed. And so, uh, No, I, I, just, I just want to jump in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think that we probably have like a 30% football watching audience. And they're, they're, back, they're backloaded. They're no, they're just like talking about that. I mean, that was a serious thing with, with, with Hamlin. It was just thinking, it's like, oh, well, they're going to give him his contract while he's injured. This guy who almost died. Oh, thank and it's, you, it's, it's disgusting that some guy who breaks their ankle or their leg doesn't get paid after, like, I mean, think about the, like, if you get injured on any other kind of job, you know, getting workers comp, getting taken care of. I mean, this is, like, a very clear labor issue. And it was just amazing to me how, like, easily the NFL got away with, like, oh, it's so sweet that after this guy almost died playing football, um, they're not going to cut his pay um, for well, the next... Well, I, I think, you know, we often forget this with college sports, is that the labor issue of what you guys are talking about, I think this is why sports to me is kind of an important thing, and why I think we should all kind of embrace some of these conversations, especially when it comes down to sports unions. These are some of the most powerful unions on the planet, yeah. right? So when these guys aren't involved in other labor struggles, it, it should be a problem. Because it also wakes up the community to labor. So when we think about college athletics and the student athlete, that term is coined after a very yes. bad lawsuit where a few young men broke limbs and weren't this back back in the day and weren't able to to play again. So they sued the NCAA, and then you get the student athlete, and you know you guys are getting your education paid, yada yada yada, million dollar athletes. When these contracts. You know what we're trying to say here is they're extremely backloaded. So you might get a hundred thousand dollars your first year, maybe two hundred thousand dollars your second year, and they renegotiate the third. That's why there's always people that are renegotiating. The talk about contracts gets real convoluted in that. So when we talk about the strength of labor unions, I think it's real important to kind of look at, like when there was the basketball strike yeah. that Obama stopped a few years ago. Yeah, an incredible moment, I think. In play ball. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're, I mean, honestly, you're 100% right, especially because in terms of labor disputes, there's nothing more front-facing than actually like professional sports disputes with their, with their leagues. And I think like we all, it's incumbent upon us all to show solidarity with those unions because it's so public, right? Mm -hmm. And um, with the NFL in particular, people don't realize that as opposed to, even though it's the most profitable league in the country, those contracts are not guaranteed. So if it wasn't for the immense public backlash and uh, understanding of what happened to DeMar Hamlin, he would not have any money <laughs> after uh, experiencing what he did. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, right. Like experience your cardiac arrest and just deal with it. But um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of what professional sports leagues deal with, it's it's a prerequisite for what the rest of us do. So, uh, good, good point, Jason. And I think that you brought up a very good point about the concept of student athletes. Yes. And in some ways, that was a legal fake out in order to keep things going as they were without acknowledging any objective realities. But also, from the way that it looks to the public, Students, and it's weird saying this like at a time where a lot of people have experience with tertiary education, mm -hmm. but you go back not that long, and students are this upper middle class sort of proto PMC category. If you can convince the public 
that these athletes that are standing up for compensation and for just treatment, or just to bond, like, or just like the free expression, like, no, just really quick, like, you know, like, I'm a big U UT Longhorns fan, and like during the George Floyd protests, um, a lot of the black players on the team started protesting um, the Eyes of Texas, which is a song uh, that they sing after every game, right? And I'm not going into it too much. You know, there's controversy about it because. Um, it was written, you know, in 1870. Yeah, in Texas. Texas. You know, so, so they, 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 but basically, all these players were trying to show up and be like public, um, you know, and be like leaders of their community. And the Bubba Boosters of the University of Texas got together and they complained because Tom Herman, the coach of the University of Texas, was not forcing the players to sing their favorite song. Which, like, look. That's the goofiest shit ever. It's like, <laughs> you're mad that some 19 year old kid is not like singing your fucking favorite song at the end of the game. Yeah. Anyway, they, they fired him and they uh, hired Steve Sarkeesian, who's been a disaster. Um, but they hired him because he was a yes man. And I, he was a guy who's not going to allow certain athletes to be able to express themselves in like, you know, important, like all of these things, like, you know, all labor rights, um, but even clearly, like very clearly, when you have a, like a profile on a platform like an athlete, like there's a question about pay and compensation, but there's also the question about your right to have freedom of speech. And you know, it's so funny. The right in Texas or across the country has been all worked about freedom of speech. I don't hear any of those motherfuckers say what? shit when they would not let those players, um, you know, I would stuff. say the most conservative motherfuckers in North Dakota are the ones who can't stand when players celebrate after a fucking touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's on the coos. That's on the coos. That's a shameful oh. act, oh. right? Isn't that what, uh, what Joe Buck said? I'm touching my pearls. Randy Moss pretended to, to move. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off now. No, but, sorry. Yeah, I mean, point being, though, I, I think that there's a lot to be learned from the fact that with these college athletes and what they're actually negotiating with their colleges is right like they're always told that they are student athletes first yeah. but the reality is, is that they are raking in millions and millions of dollars yeah. for their organizations which gets funneled into coaches salaries and also into endowments i can't think i can't stop thinking about johnny manzel and yeah. how much money he brought in for texas a and m didn't see it didn't see a lick didn't of that I mean, yeah. he's a better example for his purposes because he comes from an oil money a background, super rich right? Family. But for all of these guys, there's, wait, that there's literally a, sorry, I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. like, it is a funny thing. Johnny Manziel, if you don't know John, uh, you know Johnny Football, um, comes from a super rich family, also an incredibly like corrupt and seedy oil family. And there was a fighting cock, like you know, we fight, you know, chickens against each other. Name the Manziel. Uh, in Texas. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that makes sense. But he yeah. should be he should be taken care should of. Should have paid he did for the university. I totally agree. I'm just, the point <laughs> is a, is yeah, that okay. yeah, people don't realize that when these college athletes rake in millions and millions of dollars for their university, that all goes to their coaches. That does not yeah. go to them. It's actually legally precluded from it going to them. It doesn't so, even go to the university necessarily. Right. It Jim goes Harbaugh, basically. Yeah, it goes to these coaches, and so honestly, these coaches act essentially as, um, I don't want to say too much, but they, they, they are responsible for disciplining largely black athletes, and then they get paid millions of dollars, and the athletes get paid very little. And so um, I, I, I think it's a ground zero for a labor issue, for sure. So, going in another direction, uh, you know, we're very honored to have Emma on stage with us. Emma, you know, has been so wonderful. The majority report, but before that, you were somebody who went out and talked to people, which is a very rare thing in the I podcast. Mean, I don't even know how to do that anymore. <laughs> no, but it's, but, it's good. You know, sort of think like if Emma is like the right wing whisperer, you know, she's, uh, <laughs> you know, she's talked to so many of these people, she's covered so many of these people. I remember when she was on my show. Like a year ago, I showed her this clip of like Josh Howley saying something at a National Conservatism Conference, and I paused the way through and said, "Where do you think he's about to go with this?" And she, I don't remember this at all. And she was like, uh, <laughs> and she was like, "Yeah, I was probably gonna say blah 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 blah." Exactly what he said, right? Like so, uh, I don't know if that's okay, something. Guys, I'm smart. Something you're proud of that you are, uh, you are uh, right in Josh Howley's mind. Uh, so. Uh, so yeah, David, we were th you know we we're thinking about this because we are coming up to uh, as slightly depressing as thought as this is a presidential election, <laughs> and and people are being 
the thing is, like, for, for Donnie, for Lil Donnie, like, people have been very disloyal. Very disloyal, very disrespectful for all the Very things. disrespectful. How do people think that this guy from Florida seems to have something to It's a disgrace! And I will say, this is an anecdote, but, like, whenever Matt and I have done any DeSantis thing, we get these little DeSantis freaks in our comments, and they are like taking marching orders, like hundreds of hundreds. It's not organic. It's, it's all yeah. paid freaks. But they're 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 ready, and I'm just curious as somebody who went and you saw the people wearing the Trump hats and the whole thing. Do you think that uh, you know Mr. Ron DeSantis has the opportunity to pull away some? And a and a follow up. Uh, did they think you were one of them? <laughs> <laughs> Just My hair was white. even blonder at that oh, point. Yeah. So my highlights uh, kind of made, made me a, a bit more one of them. But, you know, I, I've been kind of vocal about the fact that I don't think DeSantis has it um, for a while. And that's just a gut feeling. I have no like, ability to predict the future. But my sense is just that it, there's a lot of, like, Joe Bush, Scott Walker, pre primary hype. That is not based in anything except for the amount of money that he's able, he, he's able to raise and the fact that there's a, a massive amount of pressure in the Republican Party establishment to get Trump without the baggage. And for, for them, DeSantis is an easy out. And so that drives a lot of the coverage, right? The concept that they can get somebody who can harness the, quote, populist energy of Donald Trump without having to actually deal with Donald Trump. Um, and I'm skeptical of the fact that that's possible. So for me, I think Donald Trump should be the front runner and should be treated as such for a long period of time. And for the rest of us in this building and the people who don't want to see the conservative movement succeed, Donald Trump being the front runner is actually a good thing. And like the Pied Piper strategy from Hillary Clinton was a, was a disaster because Hillary Clinton was the run, one running the Pied Piper strategy. If there's any other Democrat running against Donald Trump, does anyone in this room actually think that Donald Trump can win another presidential election right yes. now? Okay. He can't. Okay. Kamala. Against Pete. <laughs> Kamala. Kamala. And Pete would a judge. I totally get it, right? I totally get it. But for, for where we stand now, right, Donald Trump represents chaos. He represents anti-democracy. And I think that the, the Democrats would be smart to actually tie the Republican Party more larger, more largely to that movement, as opposed to making it just about Trump, because they're desperate to, to try to find somebody else. And I don't think the heart of the Republican Party is with anybody else. When you started doing the uh, interviews with Trumpers, uh, was Trump the front runner? Or do you remember the moment when you're like, oh, crap, Trump has this? against these losers. I don't remember the moment, but I do remember like exactly what you say, which is that, you know, any other candidate would come up and there was not any enthusiasm. And then I went to one Trump rally a week for maybe three or four months of my life. <laughs> Passionately. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, it, Off the clock. You're Thank welcome. you for your service. You're welcome. It was the privilege. Thank you. Uh, it changed my life. It really changed the way I saw the world. And also it was interesting to see how much more willing they were, were to speak with me as opposed to other reporters that I was in the scrum, right? Like I chose to actually go into the crowd, which was a different uh, dynamic. But there were other non-white reporters that were in the press pen that were treated very differently, but I think I passed as a Fox News reporter, and I was with <laughs> You think you have the fascist Barbie look? Yeah. I was with TYT, and the channel at the time was called Rebel Headquarters. Yeah. yeah. So when I'd say that, they go, oh, Rebel Media. Go, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I go, you go, yeehaw. I go, yeah. <laughs> And then they were really willing to say whatever they wanted. And so, honestly, when you provide an empathetic ear, you can get a, a lot out of people. Yeah. Well, speaking of getting a lot out of people, Emma, this is very important. Free association. Yeah. Industry. 
I know what you're talking about. <laughs> you, you have to, too, too many drinks. Um, Sorry. So David, so free association game, industry. Name an industry. He's just saying like, what, like it's a psychology thing where they trick you into What's the value. So like he's asking you, and you're supposed to say oil or, or. It's like a Mad Lib. Oh, Mad Lib for, for Trump supporters. No, just in general. What's an industry? What's an industry? What comes to mind? Podcast. <laughs> 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 like there we go. Clothing. Leather pants that are fake. <laughs> verb. Pleather. <laughs> wait, that, wait, no, ask the verb again. <laughs> She's had a few drinks. How do you pleather something? I mean, you can pleather something. I pleather the shit out of somebody. <laughs> No, my brother. Emma, tell us a verb. Huh? A verb. A verb? Uh, speak. Speak. All right. I like weather. I like it. Uh, pseudoscience. For podcasting. Don't upset anybody. Jordan, Jordan Peterson? Is that right? All right. All right. Absolutely. Um, exercise. Boxing. Cult leader. Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Works twice. I like it. All right. Uh, keep them up here. I uh, want to get um, Jake Abbott. If, uh, if Jake is in the house, I know we can, uh, we can promise him, you know, for all the Jake heads out there. If you have it. Thank you, Jake. Uh, that's not the only reason we asked him up here. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we have promised uh, Jake Abbott, but also... Uh, you know who else is here is uh, somebody who um, I don't know. You know I don't know if there are a lot of uh, Bob's Burgers fans here. <laughs> That's the, you know, probably the primary show that you're associated with him with uh, is uh, is Samuel Cedar here. <laughs> I'm not doing any free association. I'm not doing any of that. Why are we sitting on the stools? Because you're the why, talent. Why do you guys get the, the, the nice chairs? Because we're all the way we down here. The like as the, as the, as the they, 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 they control, control the sense. means of production. I'm not, I didn't dress wow. for... If you guys would have saw Cedar's Rider before the show. Of my... Huh. Hi, Sam. What, guys? What? I'm going to ask you the first question. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'll get the Shapiro formula. Okay. All right. We can do that. I'm going to bring the Shapiro formula. What are we doing? All right. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Listen, I should. Um, I was going to save this announcement for tomorrow on uh, what used to be my show. <laughs> But might as well do it here. Uh, tomorrow, when you tune in, it's the Majority Report with Steven Crowder. Yeah! Woo! And I will be joining the Daily Wire. <laughs> so, Daily Wire. Woo! Fifty fucking million dollars. <laughs> I could not believe you would degrade yourself. There were some decent arguments on the left, but now... I could not believe you I see things would, in a slightly different way. You would degrade yourself and take that slave contract. I, I, it, it is a little bit of a slave contract, but uh, I come up with $50 million. Now I realize Ayn Rand is where it's at. <laughs> she was right. She was right. That's where the better slave deals. Moocher. I love the concept of a slave contract too, right? Like, did slaves, did slaves just not have a good lawyer? That's right. right? Like, just just <laughs> smear your blood right here in a, a X-shaped formation. Thank you. We'll send this straight to Liverpool. Uh, 
Well, we lost the, uh, okay, there we go, right? We're so looking for, is, where did Matt go? This is the, uh, Matt, I think, refuses to do math, so. <laughs> <laughs> Matt's, Matt's prepping, I mean, look, this is intense shit. Matt needs to get all of his powers, and the only way he can do that is off stage for a second. Be you, can very you can just pretend that I'm Matt has the uh, equations for the good YouTuber. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, where are you? <laughs> Our prime looks sexy. Matt's vomiting right now. <laughs> I don't know math well enough to even Matt, begin this to This is pretty it. amazing that we actually made formulas for how to be a good YouTuber. I did not know this. This. This, actually is, this actually is Matt's work. He's returning to the stage right now. I think I'm All right. A bit. So, uh, so Ben Shapiro's formula, which we saw earlier, was a formula for political legitimacy, which is something that you, know, you have centuries of- we work on back home in Mexico, right? Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Yeah, you have like centuries of philosophers, and politicians, and theorists, and revolutionaries arguing about what makes a government legitimate. Ben Shapiro not only figured it out, <laughs> he has a precise mathematical formula. For, uh, that's how you get these tens of millions of dollars in your like good slave contracts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but this is this inspired. This, this inspired is almost that. as useful as finding out like at what point a slave starts using losing their sort of usefulness yeah. Yeah. equation here. <laughs> this is when we can fire you. <laughs> so Matt, what is your equation for a good YouTuber? So I'm looking at this now, and I'm realizing I probably should have studied my own work, but you <laughs> and not been high when you wrote it. Because <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even think this is the actual equation. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to understand this one. This is a YouTuber equal. <laughs> Woo! I have no idea what F means because I had. I the F shows up throughout the entire equation. <laughs> So you don't know what that means. There's more than one slide. So, uh, I assume it means feelings. Uh, I had an ideology uh, variable. I don't know where that is on this, but uh, we'll go with this. Uh, YouTuber equals uh, uh, feelings plus feelings times reality. Uh, plus S, and S is... Substance? Sam? S is Sam C. Uh, so you, you calculate all that, and then you find your F prime um, uh, minus your R prime, which is reality. Uh, and then you find out if you're a good YouTuber. You know what? I do want to say this about that. Exactly as much thought went into that as went into Ben Shapiro's film. Exactly. <laughs> Did you make this too, man? <laughs> this is producer Jordan made this. Yes, this is this is Jordan. Producer Jordan, Jordan made all of them. Yes. Can we get a shout out for producer Jordan? Oh, Jordan. Woo! Yeah, that leprechaun like creature you see up there in the uh, in the balcony. That's producer Jordan. She uh, she's, she's in my ear right now. That's what I hear her doing this. I'm getting yelled at. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, she uh, she put together the Jason's formula for effective soundboard use. Uh, for I think there's also one in here for um, anybody who's ever read Capital by Karl Marx. Uh, there's a uh, there's a formula. That's a shitload of pound of perversion. <laughs> that's like I'm a big boy. I could not. <laughs> I, I've read the paper, it was peer reviewed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. There's Marx's formula for, uh, for confusing people. <laughs> capital in chapter one. I see some stuff about yards of linen there, constant capital, variable capital. Um, I like the Greek. Right? <laughs> Latin is for everybody, but real alphas use Greek. <laughs> she move on Jordan's part. Shout out, Jordan. Yeah, absolutely. It's so funny, by the way. Like, you know, a lot of people haven't read Capital, which is fine. Um, but like, you know, a lot of people, like, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people think that it's like, fine. it's just like, it's just this long text that Mark's been like, I hate the bosses. Working people should be in charge. I hate the bosses, we should, you know, guillotine the bad folks. When literally, like, it's just like 15 chapters on, like, how much should a coke cost? 
You know Ben's teaching a class on this shit. I know. <laughs> and how much of the code? I know, actually, I actually Ab, Ab Jordan is in the class, which makes me appreciate this. That's fucked this, up. Uh, That's fucked up. But, uh, but, but I think there is something like kind of interested here in that like this is um, this is Shapiro's shtick, right? I mean, like in other words, like if you actually read Capital to use that as contrast, uh, you have like Marx like thinking really carefully about okay, I think there's this gap between the surface appearance of the economic relations that rule our lives and how it actually works. I'm going to make like a slightly different version of the same argument in 15 chapters in a row to make sure you really got it. And um, you know, Ben Shapiro, I think, is largely like his power comes from the fact that he's really confident and he talks really quickly. My power. And he's <laughs> <laughs> my power comes from the fact that I talk really quickly. <laughs> And, and he is like a certain kind of person's idea of what a smart person should be like, right? I mean, that voice that Emma just made, right? I mean, this is like, it's like, oh, he's such a nerd, he must be brilliant. Right? <laughs> look, at him, look at him making a you know, mathematical equation. There's, there's, there's got to be, you know, there's got to be something awesome and profound, uh, profound going on here. And it's certainly not the only reason why this dweeb is the as prominent as he is. I mean, there's certainly, you know, you, you were jokingly referring to the $50 million slave contract. He offered, he offered Stephen Crowder, another part of it, is that, you know, you have... No, like, I, 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 I couldn't disagree with you more. <laughs> because, the re exactly. The reason why we know the name Ben Shapiro is because he was sort of a freak show when he was 16. Because everybody likes like, oh, look at this kid who's well spoken. It doesn't really matter what's coming out. Like Jonathan Crone. I don't know if people remember him. But he, when he was 12, he was like this phenom at CPAC. Because he's a 12 year old, you know, saying what he heard Limbaugh say. And and Shapiro is the same way. It's just he ran into a guy who knew how to do business, and the Mercers happened to hook up with him, and then there was an extraordinary amount of money that poured in, and that's it. Nobody talks about Ann Coulter anymore, and nobody's gonna be talking about Ben Shapiro in 15 years. He's just a guy who got financed, and that's it. Nothing he says is compelling as an entertainer, which is what he is, speaking as one myself, we both do like infotainment, he's fucking horrible. But, but if so you give me an eighth of what was spent on his Facebook ads, honestly, yeah. I, I, I will have similar numbers. I would like a mathematical equation to prove that that was the case. <laughs> yeah. Would you and have, we'll see Sam, how you are an older Jew than I am. Yeah, so. exactly. Sam, would you have a Highlander like I wish five with mission? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would. Sam, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm not even sure I know what that means, but yes. <laughs> Sam, Sam, would one. Of course. Sam would bring up the Pope of the Jews thing. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the only one. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't, I think his appeal is largely purchased. And, uh, you know, I think that, I mean, just look around in our, our entertainment world. With the proper marketing, garbage can be incredibly profitable. And I think that's what his, you know, attribute is. I don't think that, you know, like, I, I think Limbaugh was genuinely talented. He was a horrible person. I'm glad he died. I wish he had died earlier. Um, but genuinely talented. You know, a guy like Sean Hannity? Absolute garbage. Completely untalented. Was lucky enough to get the lead in from Limbaugh on radio, parlayed that, was a good soldier, was the only person at Fox who was not actively molesting his producers. <laughs> And so his career remains. But uh, I, mean, I, I remember listening to that John. What actual talented conservative personalities? I think um, 
I think Tucker Carlson is talented mm -hmm. uh, because <laughs> to have that, that level of an absence of shame, <laughs> I mean, he's a smart guy, and to have that level of absence of shame, I think, is unique. I mean, it's it's socio, it's borderline sociopathic, but um, I think he's talented. Right? You're you're right. It could be just totally sociopathic. Like but I think he's talented. Um, there's a lot of nicotine he's got going, flowing. Uh, and a lot of money. Uh, I think, who else is talented uh, on the road? You know, I think, and he doesn't seem to be getting much attention anymore. Uh, what the, shit. Um, <laughs> Not that Savage. talented. Michael Savage. Oh, you're going old oh school. Oh my god. Yeah, I think he's still doing radio. He's, he's, Tom Likas? I mean, you're going old. No, Likas is garbage. Uh, Do you think that when you cross over to conservative uh, radio, you will be the most talented person? I, that's the thing. It's yes. And when I, I will bow. That fifty million dollars, you fucking earn that. So, so Kevin McCarthy's going to be president for the. Uh, Sam, you. That's been, just the first five million. <laughs> How much, so what does the ass look like you give up on 50 million? Like, what do you say about 50 million? Marjorie Taylor Greene is going to be able to rescind the uh, barring of only two terms for presidency. <laughs> She's going to be president for 16 years. <laughs> and that's going to be right where I'm peaking. <laughs> so, Sam, speaking of media, you've been in left media for longer than Emma's been alive. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. Say it again. I see the blank stare in her face. And I was like, back in the day. And it was like, oh shit, this motherfucker talking about shit. <laughs> see a tumbleweed going across the <laughs> stagecoach. <laughs> they had radio back when you was young, Sam. I remember one time I said I wasn't really into radio, political radio growing up. And I thought I saw Sam soul. <laughs> Who are the leftists on Telegraph? <laughs> <laughs> Sam. We were doing Morse code, and that's when. Okay, we really had to go So, I did a lot of research on your days in Air America because I don't know if you remember when you came on my show the first time, which was a very interesting time to have. Yes, I remember. Show. I have no recollection <laughs> of being on your show. <laughs> no, I, 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 but, fair, I couldn't tell you if I was on my show like prior to Friday. I just want to show you it was like a, a special day me and Pascal cried a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Cena came on because he was. <laughs> was like, ah, I, I don't know. I'm tired. <laughs> but I did do a lot of research and I feel like an asshole for doing that. <laughs> but no, I, I, well, there's a few documentaries and I had to get a lot of footage and a lot of interviews of you to get the right fucking clip. And what was, can you explain to people, because when we talk about left media, and when you came on my show, uh, because we do exist in this weird Twitterverse where people have a real skewed view of how powerful reaches are and... Uh, <laughs> Would Force the vote, bitch! <laughs> Woo! It's, uh, no, oh, that's, that's, that's great. That's good. Emma did our transition for us. We're going to spend the next hour talking about Force the Vote. No, don't do that. That's, I can't have it in my life. We're going to force that vote so fucking hard. Can't wait to force but, that but, vote. But, but, but seriously, there was, there was, I, because I, you know when people leave you on Patreon, they say like why they left, and this person left the longest comment. They said. You had Sam Cedar on your show, and Sam Cedar single-handedly destroyed the ability to have Medicare for all. And I thought to myself, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Just him? Sorry. <laughs> but, but seriously, we're not going to hold it against you. We're still going to you on the show. But I've got to say, I wish you hadn't done that. <laughs> not cool. In retrospect, I realized it was a mistake. <laughs> but, but seriously. Should have had Medicare for all. Should have. <laughs> Press this button or that button, and I just, I, I, I didn't have my glasses on. <laughs> I couldn't see which button was for Medicare for all 
not Medicare for all, and I hit the wrong button. I, yeah, to this day, that's one of the few comments I will always remember because I thought it was the funniest shit I've ever read in my life. But that being said, these political conversations have changed so much. And when you're coming in, there's actually a really interesting documentary about Sam's time at Air America. And the thing you guys are doing is you're getting ready for the big 2004 election because this is this very big moment. And when I was on your show, another time you probably don't remember. I do remember that. Oh, fuck, really? <laughs> He thinks you're talking about Friday. I doubt it. He does it all. He does it at all. We were selling ads on that. Yeah. <laughs> that is Jason, guys. Got some ads on it. Let's bring this uh, guy back in February. Uh, nobody got that. It's black history. I did. I Thank you. <laughs> um, but seriously, uh, the, the conversation back then was we have to get rid of George Bush. This is what we're pressing. We need to impeach Bush. And you were the only voice. There was no internet media sphere like this, maybe pirate radio, maybe kind of sort of college radio. What do you think about where quote unquote left media is today compared to when you were starting with people like Rachel Maddow, Chuck D, uh, Mark Marin, uh, Franken? Frank? Oh, God, Franken, yeah. 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 Um, there, there was like, there, I should just say there were a lot of blogs. Like there was, yeah. it, it, you know, blogs now seem antiquated, but at the time they were very vibrant. And it was, there was a lot of good work coming out of there. In fact, like, you know, some of the best publications now I think are, are a function of like people, the blogging that was happening at that time. But the, the, I, there, I don't think you can look at like the left media now in isolation. The, the dynamic that was really the most significant one at that time was that, um, Jesus, I can't even remember his name. Um, who, the, the guy who had the website that everyone- Daily Coast? Drudge Report? Drudge, 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 Drudge Report. Report, yeah. I mean, literally every producer in news would go to the Drudge Report to get their news, and that's and, and, and that's what would drive the conversation. And so shit would get developed on Fox, and it would get laundered through the Drudge Report, and then some you know producer at ABC would be like, "This is the news," and and MSNBC and every other channel, and so it's a very different landscape. And I think that part of it is broken. Largely in part because the right doesn't need to launder their shit through the mainstream media anymore. They don't need the mainstream media or what they call the mainstream media to get their value out of media. They don't need that anymore. And that's why Daily Wire smells blood in the water, by the way, right? To not be Fox News, to be the alternative to them. Right. To be the complete, alt uh, like, the complete juggernaut, but just online. Exactly. Because Fox News sat on, like, the sort of, like, right at the fulcrum. Mm -hmm. And their, their job was to sort of, like, take the, the shit in the swamp, launder it, and put it into the bloodstream of the mainstream media. Now the only people who care about the mainstream media are really, like, Old people in the Biden administration, <laughs> honestly, I think to our detriment. Um, and the right doesn't even care anymore. They don't, they have their own system and it functions, they get everything they need out of it. So the, the left media is not as, it's not serving the same function that it did then. I think some elements of it are to sort of like stop narratives and you know, Twitter has been a, an effective tool for that because a lot of journalists, incorrectly I think, but just like you say, like assume that what's happening on Twitter is what's happening in the country and people can jam that. I think Twitter's sort of falling apart so I think that's gonna be, that there's something that's gonna change there. But um, I think, I think the left media has been good in terms of like feeding ideas to a nascent, genuine left in this country. Left 
18 years ago, when we were dealing with the Bush administration, did not, does, did not mean what it means today. It's just a different, we did not have, you know, we would have Bernie on our show, Janine and I, and it was like, whoa, I, what's going on? I remember watching Anthony Weiner on The Daily Show call the Republicans a wholly owned subsidiary of the Republicans and feeling like, oh, this is my guy. Like, <laughs> yeah. And people thought John Stewart was that guy. I mean, and um, like, I think, what, what I think, think on of... that network, Janine and I were probably to the left of everyone, and we were not, the, the idea of using any type of like Marxist language or um, uh, notions of that were, it just wasn't on the radar. I mean, it just was not part of Janine and I's generation in terms of growing up. And, and it was not, uh, it, it, it just, it wasn't, I think, until like post-Occupy that these things sort of opened up a little bit. And that was seven years after we, we launched that in America? Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. And was it done by the time Occupy launches, right? You guys were done by that time. Oh, yeah. We were done by a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you ready to move on? Yeah, um, and I, th I think that, actually, I want to bring Bhaskar back on in a minute because you know, one of the things that happened in this, this period was uh, Jacobin Magazine uh, coming, uh, coming up, which Woo! was, Woo! yeah! Woo! Um, still didn't get as much applause as Jason saying who's in the Bay Area, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's all right. Um, but, um, but I do, Here's oh yeah, here we go. Uh, I wasn't actually sure if you were going to come out now. Wait, um, sorry, I'm so sorry to interrupt the whole show for this, but could somebody please tell me what the score of the Cowboys is? <laughs> Damn! Because I need to know. Damn. That's some dope thing shit right there. The over is totally fine. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, let's go, Cowboys. Anyway, let's go. <laughs> What uh, what year was Jackman founded? 2010. What's that? 2010. 2010. Okay. So yeah, this is uh, and Air America says off the off in like Air America. I think went out of business for the final time because it went out of business like four times uh, in 2009. Right. Um, and and I think that like in terms of what Sam was talking about a minute ago, like you know injecting. Um, a different way of thinking about you know that politics, and certainly something I was thinking about. You know, and Matt said we said a minute ago is like I can remember going to like a Ralph Nader rally in uh, in two thousand, uh, and uh, yeah, I think there was like one person who gave like half a clap for that. Uh, that wasn't that just applause line. It's just historical information, uh, and. And I remember uh, 16 years later, you know, going to see going to see Bernie rally in 2016, and thinking that it's like, all right, here's a guy who's actually running for the Democratic nomination, who's a plausible candidate for the Democratic nomination, and his rhetoric, certainly on economic issues, is like vastly the left of what Nader was running on for this like you know fringe candidacy in uh, 2000. And you know, Sam mentioned Occupy Wall Street is obviously a major thing that you know contributed to that shift. But you know, but also uh, Jacobin has certainly played a big role in giving at least a sort of um, core group of two dead people like a different way of thinking about what their politics are. So I mean, I wonder if you wanted to kind of speak to that for a bit, at, like what you were kind of going for when the magazine started and the role that you think it's played since then. Yeah, I mean, I was part of the Young Democratic Socialists from the time I was 17 years old, so I was around this very small group of socialists in America. And I thought we were all kind of weird, to be honest, but I thought not so weird that we couldn't maybe have 10,000 people around us instead of just a couple thousand. And I think that was really the goal of Jackman. It was very modest. It was to keep alive socialist ideas for another generation, maybe 20, 40, 60 years in the future. I didn't really think that anything like what we saw in 2016 and 2020 in both the US and UK would be um, on the horizon. So I was thinking, my, I was like 21, 2021 when, when Jacqueline started, but I was thinking in terms of 
it's about time to leave a legacy. <laughs> you know, I, I, there's not much to do right now. You know, I guess I could go to a few, like, you know, there's still like the tail end of the Iraq war mobilization was like, really ended in 2007, so it really was nothing. You know, the anti-globalization stuff had really uh, petered out by then, so there, 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 was, there was a vacuum. I mean, uh, you know, if we're just broadening this out a little bit, like, you know, I think it's, I'm curious to hear both of y'all, you know, just in general, like, your sense of where we are at right now, because, like, you know, we had these Bernie campaigns that I think were really inspiring and, like, really meant a lot. And, like, you know, I remember, you know, being absolutely ecstatic after, like, Nevada or all these other, like, big moments. And right now, I mean, you know, we're, I think we are in a little bit of a difficult position in trying to build a left in this country and you know it's not helped um, by the fact that like people like Ben Burgess and Majority Report are stopping brilliant strategies to, like force the vote. <laughs> <laughs> no but in fairness like you know as much as like whatever that whole zone, that was a whole insane drama but like I felt that that whole moment really spoke to a kind of helplessness that a lot of people feel in this post Bernie moment and I'm curious what you all think about where we're at because you know while I feel a lot of that kind of like depression or like you know feeling like we're not as articulate or coherent as like a political movement right now, I also do. I mean, I'm you know I just turned thirty, so I'm not like a um, you know haven't been around on the I haven't been around on the left for a really long time, but I remember when like you know when I was a socialist before Bernie, it was like a personal little secret. You know what I mean? It's like a thing that I held in my heart. And like now we get to talk to a lot of people. Like there is something here that wasn't there 10 years ago. And I think it's important to not like sit on our laurels and just sort of be happy. But, but what, what happens though when that personal secret that you keep inside, right? Because it doesn't really matter, right? I don't, no, it doesn't. It doesn't I don't know what anyone's political affiliation is in this room, right? No, it's a personal thing. It's but, a, but what happens when that thing becomes almost like a lifestyle brand? Yeah, I mean, like I remember in 2016, like the single most annoying kind of boomer was the person who would say things like, "Oh, I'm actually the left of Bernie Sanders. Uh, I'm like a you know anarcho maoist you know blah 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 right you know but but you know I think probably I'm going to support Hillary Clinton because you know, it's, like, <laughs> it's like well politics isn't actually what's in your heart. Politics is about what we do together you know, co collectively. Right? So I mean, it's 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 irrelevant you know, how you okay. understand yourself in your heart, right? I mean, what, what matters is what goes on. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, what uh, what goes on in uh, what goes on in uh, in public, and and I do wonder. I mean, if this is going what Jason was getting at, I mean, if this is like a kind of worry and sign of regression that I do see a lot more sort of weird factionalism yeah. on the left now. Than like uh, that I was see felt like I was seeing in the previous few years, and much more like what I remember when that was a secret in my heart for like 20 years before that. I I, I think I, I think the factionalism. And maybe this is aspirational, but I think the factionalism is a stage of development, and you know I I, I also think that like I could be reasonably accused of being a generational essentialist. But um, I really do think that enough people died that the concept of like socialism and even communism can be discussed as a solution to the problem of capitalism. And in a way that didn't exist prior to 2010, really, in many respects. And so. And I don't want to like, attribute it too much to to generationalism, but I, I I increasingly feel like much of this is going to be a function of there's a lot of other factors, but of of time. And I think the factionalism, you know, Bernie came out of really out of nowhere in many respects. And I don't think well, I know I know for a fact that. Bernie did not enter the 2016 election thinking that he was a viable candidate. Yeah. He entered the 2016 election thinking he was running an issue-oriented candidacy, that he was going to raise the, the, the question of, uh, of income inequality. He was waiting for, um, for Warren to see if she would run. There was a huge campaign at that time to draft Warren. 
Many of those people went over to Bernie. He did not have an operation that was generating, you know, uh, you know, I, burners or anything. I, I, I remember when he, first, when he first announced for president in 2015, he like came out, he had a speech that was like on a folded up piece of paper in his jacket. Yeah, yeah, he and, like, and he was like, I don't have a lot of time. Got to get in after lunch. He didn't have a full policy apparatus. He wasn't, it, I don't even think it really occurred to him until early 2016 when he started to sort of like, there's a chance I could win this. And he started to, like I know he at that time reached out to try and build more of a campaign at that point. And it was, it was, Largely too late, particularly for the juggernaut that was the the, the Clinton thing. But um, he, I, I think so much got invested in Bernie, but the energy pre-existed Bernie. It had not coalesced, and it had not defined itself. And I think like we are still going through the redefinition of that. And once that becomes once the sort of like central organizing principle, which was Bernie at that time, essentially becomes no longer the reliable central organizing principle, there's a lot of things that happen and people look to different places, but then I think it works through that. And, you know, we're, I, I studied late antiquity in college and we're in that period where the temple's been destroyed Everybody rushes out, and different sects are trying to come up with the, the solution. And then, you know, in that day and age, it would take 100 or 200 years before you figured out what it was. One solution was Christianity. One was, you know, rabbinic Judaism. But I think it's going to happen a little quicker because of technology these days. But I think, like, within, within 10 years, there's going to be the next iteration of that movement. And I think it's going to be more rooted in an ideology than a rounded person. I hope it is Judaism that comes, that comes And it'll be Judaism. <laughs> well, fundamental Judaism. Well, well, if, if, if this crowd all in Paris. If we have uh, <laughs> Well, uh, in this metaphor, the Rabbi Hillel of, uh, of 21st century socialism was with us on stage. Uh, so, uh, Bhaskar, do you want to speak to anything Sam just said? You, you know, I was following, in Hebrew, I was following please. In Hebrew. It, it took a turn at the end, so I will just I'll rewind to what he was saying maybe a minute and a half ago. Um, no, but I think that fundamentally, Bernie's politics, of course, was speaking to the fact that we live in a capitalist system that's predicated upon inequalities of power and wealth. But the question is, it has these inequalities and it naturally fosters resistance, but can you aggregate those daily acts of resistance to the point where collective action becomes viable for people on the scale that you would, it would need to be to change the system? And I think that's not clear. Um, right now. I mean, we uh, had from the 1860s until the 1970s, you could say discernibly, there wasn't maybe the socialist revolutions that early Marxists expected, but you could go to a working class area anywhere in the capitalist world, and you would see people who generally, maybe 60 plus percent of them, voted for some sort of party of the left. Uh, they would vote for a, you know, in a place like Italy, they would vote for a, either a socialist party that said we're going to bring about, um, you know, socialism in 50 years, or a communist party that says we're going to do it in 40 years, or a far left Trotskyist or Maoist party that said we'll do it tomorrow. You know, and, and that would, that, the aggregate of that would be 60%. Most importantly, they identified as workers, as members of a class, whether or not they're, they were bound to the class as socialist or communist militants, or they were bound to the classes in a cultural sense, but they voted for Christian democratic reform parties, or they just were members of their union or church group or whatever else. There was these deeply interwoven network in civil society that could be re resources 
in the event of social turmoil. And it could even up the odds. It, it, it sometimes did. Right now, everything is shadowed, uh, sh uh, shattered and hollowed out that I think we need something like a Bernie Sanders, not just to take the energy and discontent out there, but to galvanize it into something that's the language of politics. Because right now, we don't even have that, that language. So Bernie would take people's very personal grievances. My rent's too high, I can't afford health care. I got laid off, and I think it's my fault, or it seems like society is telling me it's my fault, and just tell people it's not your fault, it's millionaires and millionaires' fault, and we have a solution to the problem. And I think it's at that basic level that populism, in the form of the left populism of Bernie Sanders, or of Podemos in, in Spain, or countless examples throughout Latin America, is really, I think, the mechanism that we could reach people and that's often very national through um, big national campaigns, through the media, and it's almost a spark from above before it could regrow from below, which is not something I would have said five, 10 years ago, and it's, it's definitely not a traditional socialist view of, of, of change, but I think the subject has changed and we need to kind of reform the class before we could even think about uh, Changing the the country. If, if if I were to just jump in, like I think if to make it, and thank you so much. Like, like I've I've been I've been really retreating into reading a lot of like history of like the early American like labor movement and the early American socialist movement, particularly like my part of the country, like Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. And one thing that's really interesting to see, and I, I just sort of posed as a challenge because I don't have the answer to this, right? Um, but one thing that's really interesting to see is that like, for a long time, the socialists were sort of tailing the, the populist people's party, right? And it took a while before they became like a hotbed. I mean, Oklahoma was like a hotbed of socialist politics in this country in the early 20th century, a place you probably wouldn't expect. But you know what happened there was people recognized that there was a shift in the conditions of working agrarian people in that part of the country, where you had people who might have been born on a farm that their father owned or their grandfather owned, and in a generation, they still lived on the land, but they didn't own it no more. They became tenant farmers like on their own family's land, and it took a hell of a lot of fighting to reform a lot of socialists who are very like you know Marxist doctrinaires, you know like you know the peasants aren't a rent, you know like the agrarian people aren't like a revolutionary class, but they started realizing like well tenant farming, these people are becoming workers. And they started speaking to tenant farmers on the conditions of like what they were experiencing at that time. And you saw this massive explosion. And like it's a very inspiring and interesting thing. And look, obviously, like, you know, not going through all the history of the 20th century, you know, didn't get us to socialism, but they had a lot of power and a lot of influence. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that like for us right now, is like this is a very good time, I think, to start to look at like our conditions and seeing what new things are opening up, what questions and Frustrations that people are experiencing right now um, that, like, you know, are novel in the sense of, like, you know, um, an experience that's, like, uh, related to, like, the contemporary example of, like, capitalism in this country. And, like, right now, like, if you want to expand from where we're at, we really need to be thinking about who are we not talking to? Where are these struggles happening in society? Because that's the only way you're going to win. Um, and like I think that you know we're we are we are we are in like a place that's better I think than we were ten years ago. But this is a time I think not to sit on our asses and sort of just be happy with that and start always thinking how can we you know expand what questions can we be asking to sort of expand the movement from where we're at right now. Agree. Sam, before you go, I have to ask you a few questions. We're, we're doing these uh, leftist mad libs. Not, not free word association. Right? I didn't say free word association. I said something different. Why you? Why you? Why you gotta treat me like that? I, I don't know how to be Burgess. I was saying that to Burgess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cedar. Uh, pseudoscience. Yes. <laughs> it's like mad lib. You have to tell me a pseudoscience. I have to tell you a pseudoscience. Yeah. I mean, you know what a man is. You get the badass kids. Um, I, I, I the, what's a, what is a pseudoscience? See, just a, what? Give me a pseudoscience. Name one. Uh, yeah, uh, hydro hydrochloroquine. Uh, 
Give me a TV dad. Sam Cedar. <laughs> <laughs> I played a TV dad like five times, I think. Like I did five pilots called Boys and Girls. And I think I Brian Cranston uh -oh. down in the middle, right? Yes, who's home? Yeah. <laughs> we got a newborn. <laughs> Did Alan think of the theme song? For <laughs> An alcohol. Yes. <laughs> Your favorite alcohol. Ooh. I just tried Kratom in the green room. <laughs> I know exactly what you're hanging out with. Yeah. Too. <laughs> so was, yeah. Did, like, I know exactly what, where, yeah. I don't want to say his name, but I know. I don't think that's an alcohol, but it was good. I'm so. And yeah, I will. I know who you are, Kratom dealer. Okay. Uh, a popular movie. A popular movie? Name a popular movie. Oh, The Sting. <laughs> Can you name for me a past or present fashion trend? A past or present fashion trend? Let's see. Um. I'll. What about a future one? If, if you have one that you think is gonna hit. Shoes. <laughs> You'll understand in five to ten years. <laughs> a, God, I'm so mad at the person who wrote this. A self-care practice. <laughs> I will revert to alcohol. <laughs> Why was none of this what I was asked? Like, self-care practice, that's right up my alley. Oh, word. Yeah. Okay. Well, Massage. Okay. Lotions that Sam can't smell, right? <laughs> they're, too, they're too floral. Yeah, right, Sam exactly. Sam sounds like the worst foreplay dude. <laughs> oh, is that a scented lotion? Oh. <laughs> I'm not going to deny. <laughs> That is okay. A natural disaster. Lavender. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Cernovich. <laughs> and, and lastly, an ING verb. A verb that ends in I running and get big fucking key. out of here with that shit. Well, fucking, that was what? Uh, YouTubing. <laughs> well, uh, we're we gonna do the. Yeah, so, you know, earlier Sam and I were disagreeing a little bit about the sort of uh, role played by the particular shtick of reactionary figures and giving them their, their status, right? Is there something about. Ben Shapiro or Sean Hannity that makes these people particularly useful to their billionaire funders, that they can play a certain role, which is you know, my position, I guess Sam's, is that you could take anybody off the street and, uh, and, and you could put them in that role. But uh, I, I think you know, there's, there's one guy, this could be a real smooth transition if you're impressed by this. Uh, there's one guy I could have found in Jackman Magazine and we were thinking, that it'd be really interesting to see if you could identify which of these articles Jackman has actually published. <laughs> so, Bos Boscar, I want you to know it took a lot of time and a very large group effort to do this. Ah, uh, not all emotional labor is good for the working class. <laughs> is that an actual Jackman article? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, I think it is. <laughs> Survey says. No. 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 <laughs> if Kanye can't criticize Israel, no one can. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I hope if it is, then I need to leave. Right <laughs> The lost history of socialism's DIY using that gun. <laughs> That's hard. Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, is, that is not, uh, wait a minute. That 100% is. No. 
Uh, oh, what what about creepy crawlies? Oh, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Are there creepy crawlies socialists? If that's not a Jackman article, that's like a Tribune article. <laughs> that's not a public article. So you would publish that one if you have it. Well, I've published that article. The easy thing's like, <laughs> easy thing I'm going to 100% have published. I remember that, so I don't know if it's the Mandela effect. I think that guy's a part of that. So Mandela effect, there. okay. Finally, a Marxist review of the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. I wrote that. I wrote that. <laughs> That's a really good title, actually. That should be taken, yeah. But no, no. It's not, not that complicated. And in Arbor Day is Honestly, good. all of them should have had the pants. So <laughs> That's again. That's, that's very good syntax for an article. That we have not written that though. Correct. <laughs> I should write that. Uh, nuclear energy must break with its right wing past. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm a uh, avid supporter of nuclear energy, but it's Woo! popular enough in Jackman. I don't think we published that. Maybe we did. May, I'm going to go yes. I think it's yes. But we definitely did easy make up. Somebody look this up. Damn. The U.S. should learn from our founded fathers and actually abolish Dairy Queen. <laughs> That's, for whoever wrote these, I need a hire. <laughs> Jordan! <laughs> the new editor in chief of Jacob and Jordan. Seinfeld warned against double dipping, but the U.S. economy refused to listen. Anti-socialist. So that's not. That's, that's not. Wait, so there's double dipping in socialism. Of course. <laughs> um, and my personal favorite: what Cody 2012 gets right and wrong. Uh, the bylaw. Get the bylaw. I can't. I can't. Who are you reading? In, 20, in countless in 2012, countless Americans were confounded by the prospect of a little-known Ugandan warlord's grassroots campaign. <laughs> for the presidency as a bipartisan candidate endorsed by Oprah, Justin Bieber, and George Clooney. <laughs> but once the fog of confusion had lifted, one thing remained, slacktivism. <laughs> I will say, uh, for, at least for a 2023 Jackman article, that death is too long. <laughs> <laughs> Do we say no to Coney uh, 2024 Democratic primary? That's what I think. <laughs> Yeah, no, no to that one. I totally <laughs> forgot that Cody 20, 20, uh, 2012 happened. Yeah. It's, that's a, it's an all rushing back to me now. That's yeah. a big touchstone for a lot of people. <laughs> you, did, you, did you buy one of those kits? To... I remember being in Fargo in yes. my fourth story apartment being like, shit, everyone's on board of this Cody stuff. We don't get serious about African warlords. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So what you're saying is Cody 2024. <laughs> Yes. Hey, I'm saying relative to like Tim Kaine. Biden, <laughs> Biden, Cody, or Cody Biden. <laughs> Biden, Cody. Does anybody here remember Cody 2012? Oh, yeah. come on. Of course. Right. Okay, here's another question I, I want to ask y'all. And be how I be become honest. a socialist. Be honest. Who bought one of them little kits to save a little African boy from going to fight? <laughs> 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 Thank you for your service. During that time. That's what I'm saying. I though. shared it on Facebook. Right. Uh, so this is why <laughs> activism Where else has share it? activism okay, is okay. limiting. Yeah. Emma, yeah. Boscar. I didn't buy one. No, 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 I didn't. Uh, no. It's too late, Emma. The pants say something different. <laughs> it's Cody 2012. You mean pants. the pleather pants? Exactly. <laughs> Okay, we did some Mad Libs with you guys, and now we are going to show you what y'all said. Oh my goodness. Is this Boscars? Uh, ben has the list. Yeah, so, yes. Uh, so, for Boscars, for ba Boscars Mad Libs answer, uh, 10 reasons to oppose the vegan law. That doesn't really make sense. <laughs> that one doesn't work. Next one actually works pretty well for Boscar's answers. The U.S. should learn from Cuba and actually expropriate. <laughs> Pop punk is about Boscar. <laughs> Dragon Ball Z must break with the <laughs> Protesters in Havana are demanding Cuban food. <laughs> That's Unfortunately, because of the embargo. It's because of the embargo, right? Nothing to do with Central Planet. 
The electric slide is not the answer to that. <laughs> I'll write that piece. Oh, podcasting, trade you do this, have long fought for fake leather pants. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, leathering is a very good idea. <laughs> no, really, Jordan Peterson is good. Pants. <laughs> I will say that Matt McManus and I actually wrote an article for Jack but a couple of years ago called Jordan Peterson is Wrong About Everything, so this would be quite a diversity of views <laughs> if, uh, if they also published this. Uh, ooh, Nationalized Rebel News. <laughs> and actually, Jordan Peterson is bad. <laughs> this, this is the thing. The, the, the fact that you have both of them actually is consistent, right? That checks out. All right. Oh, uh, do we have the next? Uh, so, okay, so this is at the bottom of the slide. I know you can't see this. That says, uh, not all, so this is from some of Sam's, not all hydrochloroquine is good for the working class. <laughs> uh, we should have listened to Sam Cedar about Kratom. <laughs> Let's stop talking about the sting. It's high time to abolish future shoes. <laughs> um, it's not that complicated. Ending massage lotion is good. <laughs> and oh, yeah. So I think this uh, putting together the uh, the last um, the last couple of bad lip answers uh, Jordan has here. The left should oppose Mike Cernovich by fucking. <laughs> that was a great One way to do it. Yeah. One way to do it. You have your orders. <laughs> There's nothing that could upset Mike Cernovich more than you getting laid. <laughs> Without having taken his course. <laughs> he has a course on fucking. It's called Be a Gorilla. Who said it from the crowd like y'all went? So no one take that course. <laughs> I think he has an advanced date rape course. Wow. Uh, uh, <laughs> was that wrong for me to say? Not <laughs> <laughs> Mike Cernovich? He's so good. in the audience, experience. <laughs> Bullshit. What? All right. We're, we're going yeah. to take some questions. Some, questions. some questions. We're going to do some questions. I'm waiting for a microphone. <laughs> well, uh, before we take questions, I did want to say, in all seriousness, um, yeah, uh, I should say, so I was going to, about to uh, to bring up our, uh, to uh, bring into the conversation, rather, uh, our producer at GTA, Jake. Uh, we actually have all three of the GTA producers in the crowd somewhere. Uh, it's like being a for Slack. So, uh, we can do that last in the position, but, uh, but Jake is a survivor. I believe in him. I should say also, our graphic designer, Andy, is off to the side doing courtroom sketches, which uh, will be available at the merch table, along with the t-shirts and posters and all of that stuff. But uh, Jake is not just a podcast producer, even though that is obviously the highest calling in life, uh, is to produce podcasts. Uh, he also has uh, worked uh, quite a bit as a union organizer. And uh, you know, when, when we were, you know, we were thinking about this because going along with something we were talking about earlier about sort of post Bernie uh, dislocation and fracturing and all of that stuff, you know, what we you know, what you can kind of orient people to, you know, to feel hopeful about, that, you know, that's like a concrete thing that they can do. I think uh, involvement in that, you know, has, has got to be near the top of the list, that, they, uh, that uh, even though we still see this overall decline that has not stopped, right? I want to be really clear on that, like it's, it's kept going. But there have been these signs of life in organized labor in the last, uh, in the last year or so. That you know we have um, this is not a pop quiz, but do you approximately do you know how many Starbucks have been unionized? Uh, Two hundred sixty-eight, according to Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, there's you know, they're using nice Amazon warehouses, which is something that felt like impossible uh, very uh, very recently. You know things things have been been picking up a little bit. I think this is something that more people that like people who 
you know, would go to an event like this, uh, want to think about how they could support, how they could be more involved in, and I was just wondering if you could speak to some of that. Yeah, well, I'm assuming there's more workers in the audience than owners of capital who could, who could become involved. All right. Everybody who owns their means of production say, yeah. woo! Owners of capital, speak up! <laughs> But yeah, I mean, even though, as you said, overall, like union density, like the numbers just came out, right? Union density did fall uh, over the last year from 10.3 to 10.1 percent. There's a lot of um, organizing that went on that some people, at least like a year or two ago, would have told you is probably impossible. One is the Starbucks, the other, right? Someone said Chris Smalls, who organized his Amazon warehouse. Uh, so, and I think the main thing is more that, you know, of all the things that we talked about today, and we're talking about the fracturing, you know, post Bernie, getting involved with the labor movement in some capacity is probably the best and quickest way that you can get involved in socialist struggle, um, especially in between election cycles. So, I mean, I would encourage everyone, if you don't know what to do, like with your summer, just go work at Starbucks and try to organize it, I think. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, uh, and and I love the fact that that is uh, that's a you know that's not an unrealistic goal at the same point, right? There have been literally hundreds of successful campaigns, and Starbucks that kind of you know pushing back with everything they can. They fired a lot of people, you know. They are yeah. So for every store, uh, there's been at least like. For every store, there's been at least one unfair labor practice of Starbucks doing something illegal to retaliate against workers who are trying to organize. Um, but so um, I am not a worker. I am very much PMC. Uh, <laughs> where are my blood suckers at? <laughs> this is uh, this is something. Uh, my, my toast at Cuba's wedding, I referred to his friends who were uh, blood suckers from the military industrial <laughs> complex. And that, was, uh, and that was his response to that. But for all my blood suckers, the, it turns out that workers are kind of necessary. They kind of do things that are really important. And it turns out no one is paying attention to them. So, if you want to do one good left thing that makes you feel like a better person, pay attention to them. Listen to Matt Lack. Or help organize workers and care about organization. So we have some questions from Patreon, and I think uh, most of them are aimed at Sam Cedar. They're not a fuck with you. But we do have some questions from Patreon. Uh, yeah, who's reading? Jordan, are you reading the questions? I, I know that, but that person isn't talking right now. Oh, I don't know why then. So, <laughs> if you've watched my show, you know there's a, there's a voice that you hear that sometimes we joke and say is an AI creation from Pascal and I. It's actually a real person. And they're here. It's M2 Song. M2 Song! Yeah! M. Tucson, is your mic working? My mic is working. Okay. M. Tucson, how are you feeling tonight? I'm feeling all right. I'm feeling all right. Do, do I have time for a quick uh, landlord acknowledgement? Just <laughs> <laughs> like to let my landlord know I, I, I got you. <laughs> Boshkar got my back. <laughs> a landlord acknowledgement. <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. That was not in the free rights for the show. So Apparently, they like to be acknowledged. The rent checks. Egress. Tucson. Are we ready? Okay. We are ready. So I sent you some questions. Mm -hmm. um, you're looking them over now to see which questions are going. You're going to ask. Yes. You um, want to ask Sam Cedar the first question? Do you want the names? You want to dox people? You always yell at me on the show about that shit. Yeah, please all uh, address information that they want. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead and say the name. Go ahead and say the name. Fuck it. Yeah. They, they felt bold enough to put it. Fuck it. I love you, This is from Eduardo Roca. I was wondering if there seems to be a need to discuss more about science and technology from the left. With subjects such as climate change, city planning, renewable energy, and other industries of clean energy, 
agriculture, etc. Wait, I didn't hear. Can so we get can we a little bit of the monitors? Can we get a little bit of that to her in the monitors? We can't really hear. Can was it was the question that uh, should we be discussing more about the technology left, on yes, the left? Technology and science on the left. Yes. Sure. I mean, I I am not qualified to talk about. But I mean, we interview some people who get into like policy. But I think broadly speaking, it would be helpful to have you know, people out there who are talking about nuclear power, for instance. You know, Woo! how yeah. dangerous is it? How, oh. you know, what would it take to ramp it up? I mean, it would be nice to have these answers sort of like floating out there. Yeah. The right has these, uh, an enormous amount of resources in terms of think tanks that develop all of these answers that they need which generally end up being like, cut taxes. That ends up being the, the, the answers. But they, they, have these, they have these policies laid out for the, for the windows where they have the opportunity to push them. We don't really have that on the left. Um, there's been you know, attempts at the times, but very important to develop these ideas even when there's no opportunity to implement them. Because more often than not, those opportunities show up and they, they're they very ephemeral, they go away very quickly, they exist without warning, and so good to have these ideas out there and to build support behind them so that when those opportunities arise, you're the, in the lead. You and something. build them outside of private context, right? As opposed to, you know, the, I feel like there's a lot of technological discourse that is completely sectioned off from the left that is meant to be in the private sector. But if the left is more engaged in these topics, then we can talk about like, why does this need to be completely private? This should be a public conversation, it should be public discourse, public uh, resources as well. Hello, you may remember me from not being a worker. <laughs> and, Part of the community of not workers is the like technical intelligentsia that contribute to the profits of Google or the lethality of the military industrial complex. And on the one hand, many of them are actually very studently indebted leftists that really need the rent check. And um, to you I say, reach out to those friends from college, to them I say, yeah, like start thinking about what it would mean to take what you actually believe should be the future, what you think is the better path for mankind, and apply that to the work that you're doing. And, you know, if you've got something good going on, leak it to Sam Sater. <laughs> Majority reporters at gmail.com. <laughs> I, mean, I will say sometimes in the left we use like the word technocrat as a as a negative thing, as an insult, because like what we're really thinking about is a kind of liberal politics where you sort of think that politics is this like ideologically neutral thing where you just have experts come up with um, with with solutions to your problems. And, you know, and it's it's not about clashing interests or clashing ideology. And so of course we don't like technocrats in that sense, but like actual liberal technocrats. Are fine. Like you actually need those, you know, to uh, to do anything to achieve your political program. You build socialism. You know that, like, you know, it's not like we don't like, a, you know, I don't know, environmental engineers. Yeah, I mean, if if uh, if the left actually was in power, uh, the technocrats would flock to us because they would need state jobs. You know, they they would need. But well, often when we think about science and the left and, and all these these questions. Uh, we're not thinking about like civil engineers and the people who are the bedrock of all these attempts at third world socialism and were just the, the civil service was, was often the social base of a lot of those, those governments. So I mean, when the left's in power, we get technical expertise. When the left is super small, it's been cloistered on universities for the last 30, 40 years in places like the US. You get people with humanities backgrounds, like you know, like myself, you know, <laughs> that thing, who who don't have that that expertise. So I kind of think it it comes when you grow a movement, you have have more people 
active than it comes like when you're you're actually in, in, in power. So I'm not too stressed about our lack of of, of prowess there. Though we do have some groups like um, Science for the People is one group. There's a handful of, of explicitly socialist um, kind of STEM-based groups out there and others. And, and at the risk of sounding like a shit lib, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, the value of a democratic administration, and there's a lot of things that are not necessarily valuable, is that these agencies open up to people who are who have relationships with other people who are left of center. And so there's an opportunity for to build these institutions. I mean when when Hillary Clinton did not win, there was a lot of people who had sort of banked on that 12th year of a democratic administration who were, you know, in their late 50s and their 60s, basically like, my career is over. I'm done. Like all the things I had built towards are not gonna happen. I'm not gonna get in there. I'm not gonna be able to push this agricultural policy, this economic policy, this FDA measure, this EPA measure. And for all those people at that age cohort, there are people on the other end who are not gonna enter in there because they're not gonna get hired. And so, you, you, I mean, people have to see administrations as a, for what they are, which is, in many respects, a huge patronage machine. And it's not as naked as it was, you know, in Tammany Hall days, but people get jobs because they know somebody who knows somebody. And when a right-wing, when a Republican administration is in there, no one on the left is gonna get in. When a Democratic um, administration is in there, completely open to the, uh, the assessment that that is just less right wing, but nevertheless, the social and professional relationships are gonna get more leftists in that administration in all of these agencies. I mean, you're talking about tens of thousands of people who enter the civil service and are there for decades. And so... Um, not, not just the civil service, but you also have to consider all of the contractors and the privatization. Everything is tangential and ancillary to that as well. I mean, it is really like you're, you're feeding a big machine that is more likely to end up in the pockets of people that you like or vaguely like, and they're going to promote policies that you like or vaguely like. Yeah. Uh, it's not that complicated. Abolishing Republicans is good. That's a, that's a jacket article. All right. Uh, Boy, Stevens, baby. <laughs> All right, uh, we are going to be hanging out. We're going to be at the bar. Uh, we aren't going anywhere anytime soon, but uh, we do have to close this out. Um, I am uh, I'm really, really happy and grateful uh, for all the people who are on stage. Uh, this is, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a, other than Sam, who, who decided <laughs> not to do Medicare for all. Everybody else, you know, I love very much. Wonderful. Um, Okay. Uh, Conan, real quick before we go. Yeah, real quick before we go. Uh, I just like to point out that we do have a merch table situated over the door. There's a limited amount of Give for Revolution shirts. Left Reckoning needs to have a checks notes QR code. Left Reckoning, we're doing a deal on our merch. So oh, it's not here. So check that out. It's at the table. You get access to that. Is this, you like is this crypto? QR code. It's crypto, right? It's crypto for sure. <laughs> We're doing crypto, we're doing QR codes, which is the same thing, don't ask. Any we're just rushing, we get it, yeah. yeah. Uh, also, one more shout out for uh, J. Andrew World over in the back there. He's doing a good round of applause. He's doing coping sketches of uh, various things during the night they've been to say as well. Yeah. If you've ever seen, you know, if you watch the show, you know that like, Andy will sit there kind of quietly and then he'll come back with some hilarious picture or something something just said. 
He's been doing that. He's been doing core group sketches. He has posters. So yes, absolutely. Give it up for Andy. Give it up for Andy. You can also find him on Movie Dad Extravaganza with me and Forrest Miller over there. Give it up for me. Thank you, Forrest. Forrest. Tyra is the working part of the team. And thank you to the Pettit Room staff. Yes. Right now. Thank you. Uh, also, Watch Left Reckoning, uh, Matt and David. So, so happy. Round of applause, everybody. Give it up. Thank you, thank you, Emma, of uh, Jordan Report and the Emma Sports. Emma Vega! Emma Sports, Woo! give it up for yes, he did. Thank you, Sam Cedar, even though you don't want to step up. What a fucking nightmare. Sam Cedar, everybody! Thank you, Boscar Sports. Boscar! Jack in the Magazine, putting socials in that little half of the American politics. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Longest survived the GTA. Jay and unions generally. Jay, everybody. Jay and organized labor. Uh, thank you, Cuba. Uh, Deep State Cuba. Who's like one of six people? I don't know any of you, and I was never here. He's like one of six people who went to Ivy League universities. I don't hate. Uh, thank you, Conan. Coda Dutra. You're mispronouncing my name, but thank you anyway, Ben Burgess. I, it is so much better than I'm, you know, like that's as good as you're gonna get. Yeah, well, but real quick, give it up for Ben Burgess, everybody. I can say that you can. And last but not least, my neighbor uh, on uh, just on the Mexican side of the border, host of This Is Revolution, yeah. uh, my favorite uh, podcast other than the one I'm, uh, that I host. Jason! Jason!